Good evening. I would like to call our Town of Sydney regular council meeting on Monday, June 13th uh, to order at 6 p.m. Uh, good evening to my uh, councillor colleagues. Uh, we have, um, for those who haven't uh, attended a meeting recently or uh, a, a meeting before, uh, coming out of the pandemic, we are continuing to uh, conduct our meetings in a hybrid fashion when necessary, that is, have members of council uh, present in the chamber, uh, but also allow uh, council members to participate via Zoom. So you can see, and good evening to Councillor Rintoul and to Councillor uh, Duncan, uh, who will be participating by Zoom. You can see them on your screen uh, to the left there. Uh, you will certainly hear their audio uh, when they speak. Um, uh, good evening to staff in attendance uh, in the chamber, but also um, uh, may be participating via Zoom. Again, you will see them on the screen and you'll hear their audio, uh, and I will introduce them. And um, good evening to members of the public uh, here in the council chamber uh, and to those who may be watching the live web stream uh, or to those who are watching a recording of uh, the meeting at a later date. I'd like to uh, begin with uh, territorial acknowledgement and respectfully acknowledge that we're holding this evening's meeting in the territory of the Wasanich Nations. Uh, we uh, are grateful to be sharing these lands with the Wasanich people uh, and we acknowledge that this is their home, has been their home for millennia. I will turn to approval of the agenda and we do have uh, three amendments uh, to the agenda that was uh, published last Thursday afternoon. Uh, the first is um, with regards to item 5C, uh, the official community plan. On page 49 of your agenda package, there is the single page bylaw uh, that is written and uh, council today received a housekeeping update. There is a, re a reference to section 26 of the Local Government Act and that has been corrected to section 14. Um, and so that's a housekeeping change. Uh, the second is that uh, also under item 5C is that um, uh, a staff report was provided uh, by Mr. Newcomb, our Senior Manager of Long Range Planning as part of the agenda package for the OCP. Uh, and today, uh, Mr. Newcomb provided uh, a second uh, staff report uh, which is uh, was forwarded to council earlier today and is considered part of the agenda. We'll be making reference, Mr. Newcomb will be speaking to it uh, when we come to that item. And the third is also, amendment is also with regards to the agenda. We did have four uh, items of correspondence uh, submitted prior to the agenda being published on Thursday afternoon. Those uh, four pieces of correspondence, as you may have seen, are included in the agenda package. Since the agenda was published, we have had 32 additional pieces of correspondence. Council has received all of those pieces of correspondence, reviewed them. Uh, they do form part of the agenda. Uh, and we will be making reference to those again when we come to item uh, 5C. So I would seek a motion to approve the agenda as amended, please. I'll move the, uh, the agenda be approved as amended. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? None opposed. That motion carries. Thank you. We're next turning to our uh, regular public participation uh, period. Uh, I do note um, the... Uh, number of uh, members of the public in the gallery this evening. Our public participation period is normally scheduled uh, for speakers to speak for a maximum of four minutes. Uh, we will keep with that tonight, uh, to be fair to everyone. Uh, but we, uh, we allocate uh, uh, 20 minutes uh, to public participation. Uh, I, would, um, uh, I will just move a motion to extend uh, the public participation period to allow anyone who wishes to speak tonight for four minutes. Second. Moved and seconded, any discussion? All in favor? None opposed, the motion carries. So again, for those who may not have participated uh, or been in public participation before, we invite you to come to the podium. There's a little button to activate the microphone. You'll see a red light come on. We ask that you provide your name and address and you do have four minutes to speak. We do have a timer uh, over on the, uh, uh, beside uh, Mr. Humble um, and it does have a green light uh, for four minutes and then I think goes to a yellow shortly before and then a red. I'm not going to call a hard stop uh, at four minutes, but I will ask you uh, close to that time uh, to please uh, conclude your remarks. We do want to be fair to everyone speaking this evening um, and providing information to council. So with that, I will for a first time will call. Is there anyone wishing to address council? Please come forward. Please come forward. Thank 
you, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Dennis Carlson. I'm here tonight speaking as a representative of the Sydney Community Association. But I also want to point out that the um, Sydney Community Association is a member of a coalition of community groups that have come together uh, and provided a coordinated response to this OCP. Um, I should note that we have put in a lot of time and effort and um, I am hoping that this has been of some use to both staff and council. Um, we certainly acknowledge that based on the council direction and the public input, this is a much improved OCP from the first draft that was uh, issued. Um, as the OCP bylaw references, <coughs> this is referred to as the uh, OCP uh, Sydney 2040, I believe, which uh, obviously means it's intended to provide guidance well into the next couple of decades. And we would expect that future staff and councils will have very different attitudes towards how the OCP will be implemented. And for that reason, we think it is critically important that there is clarity regarding key issues such as the Cedarwood site and downtown, to name a few. Since the initial draft was done, there's been um, extensive changes to the various drafts that have been issued for the public. Um, however, we consider it somewhat disingenuous that today is, was given as the deadline for public comments, as well as council's consideration of first reading of the bylaw. In terms of the implementation section of the OCP, despite our requests that this section be more definitive, this section clearly describes a process, but doesn't really give any indication of the future initiatives that need to be undertaken by the town. In our opinion, in order to keep the OCP live and relevant, this needs to have a very clear implementation section. Our expe ex expectation is that council will refer, this, refer to this for direction during the strategic planning and budget deliberations, which I acknowledge is mentioned in that section. However, to make statements that, to the effect that council is not held to any, any of the recommended further actions, to us, in many respects, kind of undermines the validity of the whole process that we've been going through. That concludes my comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carlson. I invite the next speaker. If you could just press the button, yeah, thank you. Just press it, okay. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Adrian Kershaw, and I live at uh, number 11466 one, West Haven. Um, and I'm here uh, on behalf of the group that we're working with, uh, Saving Our Sydney. Um, I, I've sent you this document, but I just, uh, just touch on a few uh, critical issues. Um, First one, the, the technical guidelines for downtown construction and, uh, and redevelopment are far too complex, in our opinion. Um, they won't really be much help at all to residents to figure out what the hell is going on, or to developers to give them some guidelines uh, as to what they should do. What we find really interesting is that um, West Sydney um, has a, its own local area plan, but there's nothing for the downtown. That doesn't make any sense to us. I mean, you need a, a clear direction about where you're going, and we need some clear direction to maintain the look and feel of the, of the community that uh, everybody appreciates. Secondly, um, meeting places downtown. Uh, you've, uh, in, in the OCP, early on OCP, you had a, a reference to a, a plaza. Um, there's no indication about what that it, where that is. Um, it, I, I referenced the, uh, the, 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 um, um, uh, 
the seat, seat, seating on the, on the corner of Mal Malibu and, uh, and Third. And uh, that's really, really often well used. It's barely a time I drive by that it's not somebody there chatting. And I've noticed coming in that we now have a bench over the other side of the road on that area that's just been put in by the, one of the new buildings. That's the kind of thing that we need. But where's the plan for it? Moving on now to uh, the gateway uh, designation. Um, our feeling is that uh, we need to send a clear, substantial message to the airport authority that we're not interested in having retail on there, on that site, uh, be, for all the stuff that we went through when uh, a few months ago. Um, so what we would like to do is to amend the current C5 zone to the, elite, the retail on that site. I, I know that does not have any you know, power on the, air, on the airport, but it gives them a much, much clearer idea of where we, want, where we don't want to go with that site. And finally, I want to talk about liverboards. Um, uh, I live uh, opposite Seam Harbor and uh, walk around uh, that area very often. And uh, as I've indicated in here, in 2004, there were three or four boats um, on, uh, on buoys. There are now well over 100 buoys placed in that area. That's had a, a significant impact on, um, on eelgrass. Uh, I've noticed that there are fewer and fewer birds, birds uh, hunting there. They have to go somewhere else. And uh, what is happening is we have about mm, 10 or a dozen people living on board, anchored out there on the buoys. And not at all interested in dealing with sewage the way people would do if they were in a marina. So what we're getting is, is uh, pollution in, into Seam Harbor and elsewhere. And what we would like um, is for the uh, council to take a leadership role in this. I recognize absolutely that it's complex. There are a number of different um, government agencies involved. But somebody has to step up and say, we have to deal with this issue now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kershaw. I invite our next speaker. Good evening, Mayor and Council and public attending. My name is Steve Duck. I'm at 2243 Amelia Avenue. And I'm here to speak directly to how the OCP addresses the Cedarwood site. At your May 5th meeting, Council directed the OCP provide additional guidance regarding the form and density of the Cedarwood property. Rather than respond to the council direction, the OCP arbitrarily splits the site into generic multi-unit residential and neighborhood commercial designations. With respect to the multi-residential units on this site, policy 5.3.4 in the OCP supports a multi-unit residential up to a height of four stories. Policies 5.3.10 and 5.3.11 make reference to the sensitive, sensitive transition to and compatibility with adjacent low density neighborhoods. It is fine to make the statement that the broad policies will be subject to the implementation by future staff and council at the time of rezoning. However, the implementation of these vague policies as part of rezoning will no doubt result in confrontation between the expectation of neighbors and public and the interpretation of the policies by staff and council. It is also surprising to us that the de design guidelines in section 25.6 make no reference to how the massing of a multi-unit residential development would respect adjacent lower density neighborhoods. Further, neighborhood commercial. Despite the intention of the type of neighborhood commercial would serve the surrounding neighborhood, the OCP does not limit the amount of commercial space that would be de developed on this site. The policy limiting the maximum floor space of each tenancy to 200 square meters may be applicable to a small commercial site such as Rest Haven and Malibu, but in the, is inappropriate to the approximately 1.5 acre portion of this site that would be included in neighborhood commercial designation. 
Lastly, I'd just like to comment on uh, the development. You've done a tremendous job in the revisions of this OCP, which was completed and, uh, by this council two weeks ago, and you gave the public 14 days to respond, 10 business days. This is a document, if it reflects on the last one, that lasted 15 years. To give the public only 10 days to review it is inappropriate. I don't think that is anything reflective of the work that's been done on this document and the respect you should give to the public on what it should be and how long that document is going to stand for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duck. I'll call for a second time for speakers. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. My name is Jocelyn Gifford, 10448 Albay Road. Uh, I'm here to speak to the environmental aspects of the new final draft. Um, Bob Peart of the Saanich Peninsula Environmental Coalition regrets that he cannot be here tonight. Um, he has sent in comments from both Friends of Shoal Harbor, which he chairs, and the Environmental Coalition. Um, all organizations support the emphasis on collaboration and recognition of not only municipal neighbors, but also the Wissanich uh, nations, of course. Um, there are many very positive changes in this draft, both from the current OCP and from the earlier draft. Uh, climate change. Objectives and policies are stronger and now in the same uh, chapter as environment. We really need to think of climate change in every aspect of the OCP and every decision, especially regarding development. There are good policies here. We look forward to the new, more detailed climate change paper sort of uh, policy for Sydney. Environment. Uh, we're very pleased to see the new official environmentally sensitive areas at All Bay and Seam Harbor, Armstrong Point, Thumb Point, and Shore Acres. That's um, well, well done, <laughs> thank you. Um, plus the reinstatement of the Lockside Shoreline ESA, all with clear po purposes and policies. Um, Roberts Bay, Beaufort Grove, uh, Kelset, Ray Creek, and Mermaid Creek ESAs have expanded boundaries and updated policies. All of these areas are critically important habitat for key species like forage fish, herons, and migratory birds. The inclusion of town-owned ESAs with good objectives and policy emphasizing best practices helps all of us understand the sensitivity of these ecosystems. The DPA guidelines are tightened up and a lot clearer in this draft, although the liberal use of the word should rather than will or must is, remains, uh, remains troubling. Um, how are decisions going to be made about all those shoulds and by whom? Uh, the natural features map, I just want to say, uh, is an excellent accompaniment. It should be a schedule. Um, I hope it will be prominently accessible on the town website with a Zoom function. Uh, for Mermaid Creek, for the M Mermaid Creek ESA, work toward renaturalizing it is a good goal, uh, but restoration is both urgent and important. I recognize that it's already in Council's strategic plan. Thank you for keeping the expanded riparian ESA boundaries around Mermaid Creek while moving back the multifamily zone. Uh, the return of a marine zone with good updated policies and objectives is very important to Sydney as a sea seaside town and to getting a handle on management of illegal mooring buoys and derelict boats and managing that whole area. However, the inclusion of marine-based housing, as Adrian um, said, potentially outside marinas is a significant concern to anybody interested in the health of our waters. Bird-friendly design and dark, fly, dark skies policies are important new environmental features of the OCP. However, remaining concerns, I think there's inadequate, um, inadequate attention to the bioregional framework. 
Um, there's lots about connectivity and collaboration, but it doesn't sort of fit, uh, fit together. Um, and then implementation is certainly an issue, as Mr. Carlson has said. Um, the implementation section describes a process, gives no indication of the key initiatives that should be undertaken. The, the Environmental Coalition um, said this section requires a publicly available, more definitive action plan that establishes baseline data, timeframes, metrics, and provides a summary of the key recommendations to keep track and ensure that the policies and strategies outlined in the draft OCP are implemented in a timely and successful manner. Uh, and Central Saanich has done, has done this well. They seem to be a good model for a number of things. Developing resources and expertise that can be shared among peninsula municipalities could facilitate implementation. Staff capacity is another um, issue. The Saanich Peninsula Environmental Coalition remains concerned that the Town of Sydney does not have the financial and staff capacity to either undertake or monitor the considerations described above, particularly as it res relates to terrestrial and marine environments. It would be unfortunate if a well-intentioned official community plan is not able to deliver as described. To be successful, all these measures will require appropriate developmental concern and enforcement, and we're not confident that the town will be able to deliver given current capacity. We would welcome opportunities to discuss how local environmental organizations can support staff in obtaining the required resources. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Ms. Goodford. I invite our next speaker. Mayor and Council, my name is Gerald Moffat and I live at 9512 Lockside Drive. At the May 30th meeting, the Mayor announced that the town would be open to community OCP feedback up till 4 p.m. today. This was an excellent and very welcome announcement. Although not all the information flowed from the May 30th meeting to allow a timely response by the community. People didn't find out the minutes of May 30th till June 9th late in the day. By extending public input to June 13th, the mayor made an implicit promise that council would be open to making OCP changes based on that input. Today, I call on the mayor and council to honor that implicit promise to be receptive and responsive to resident input and to vote to change the OCP at the Cedarwood. The mayor and council may have wavered and gone back and forth on how to deal with the Cedarwood site. But Sydney residents have never wavered. They have consistently and repeatedly said they do not want multi-story condos popping up in low-density residential neighbours, including at the Cedarwood. How loudly and how many times must residents say it before it is accepted? In the run-up to this meeting, residents have sent many letters to the town clearly expressing their views. There was even a 121 signature petition signed by most of the neighbours around the Cedarwood calling on mayor and council to designate the west section of the Cedarwood townhouse residential. Those letters and the petition may be new, but the message they convey is not new. It's the same as it's always been no multi-stories at the con uh, condos at the Cedarwood. The town has made a magnificent effort over the last two years to obtain and listen to community views and fold them into the new OCP. Openness, transparency, attentive listening and responsiveness have been hallmarks of the town's approach to the new C OCP so far. Those principles must not be jettisoned in the home stretch in a mad dash to get the OCP bylaw passed by July the 1st. The OCP should be improved, and fortunately, it still can be. 
I strongly urge the Mayor and Council to reconsider and vote today or as soon as the issue is available to amend the draft OCP bylaw to designate the west part of the Cedarwood as townhouse residential. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Moffat. I'll call for a third time if there are any other, please come forward. Hello, I'm Linda Comber and I live at um, 317 10459 Rest Haven Drive in Sydney. And I'm the excitable crazy one that, <laughs> that seems to be waving my hands a lot and, and worrying about trees. I'm a tree hugger and I'm a tree carer and, and uh, so I just thought I'd mention a little bit as referenced in the OCP. I did get some answers today from Corey from some questions I asked but I'm still going to cover them anyways. <laughs> so I just wanted to um, say hello to council, staff and audience and um, I wanted to restate some facts about the value of trees. I'm not going to go on forever, I, I won't be too long. <clears throat> trees provide a wide range of beneficial environmental, social and economic services such as heating and cooling costs, increasing the value and beauty of property. They improve the livability of urban areas and contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation, which is really um, high up there on everyone's priority list. <clears throat> Trees are carbon sequesters, removing tons of pollution from our air. They contribute to biodiversity by providing shelter and food for wildlife. They absorb and filter and store water and nutrients and contribute to stormwater management, very important. Large trees provide 16 times the value to the community compared to small trees over their lifetime. <clears throat> I do acknowledge the language regarding trees in the OCP has some good intentions. But according, I have to say, I asked Corey, or we had some talk with Corey Newcomb, and he said that the town may not implement any of the recommendations in the OCP, they may not. We're just writing this up and we may not follow through with it. That's my understanding. I hope that's not wrong. <coughs> so um, for in the 12.3.9, uh, which says continue to protect and preserve significant tree stands um, is in there, but there's nothing mentioned about single trees or small stands um, So and root protection. So um, apparently that might be in the urban forest strategy separate paper. So. That was one answer I got, so that was good. Thank you, Corey. <coughs> the other one was tree density target of canopy cover to be increased to 18% from 15%. So I wonder if there's a projected timeline for that. This could, you could say, okay, well, next year we're going to go up a percent, and then next year we're going up a percent. But so far, it could be all at once in 10 years, and not any time be between now and 10 years. So I think there should be some accountability about how often there's a check and how much the increase is happening per year. Duncan is um, projected to go 40% by 2024. <coughs> and 12.3.16, retain and plant trees on boulevards, municipal pro property, and parks <coughs> to address climate change. So that's really good. There is a climate change crisis now, so there must be a plan with guidelines to quickly address this crisis. There's no plan about how often, how much, when, where, who's, when. I don't know, there's, there's, it just says we're going to do this, but there's no target. There's no target time. So I'd really like to see somewhere, sometime, how this is going to be implemented and how quickly. Uh, there should be specific and measurable procedures for the above in order to monitor the implement of the OCP recommendations. Um, yearly reviews supported by numbers, successes, and shortcomings, such as by the end of 2024, we will have 17%. By the end of 2026, we will have 18%. That kind of thing. Just have a goal, because you can't reach a goal if you don't have a goal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Comer. I'll ask for a third time if there's anyone wishing to address council. 
seeing none uh, thank you to everybody who came uh, uh, came tonight but also came to uh, to address council we appreciate your input so I will close public participation uh, we'll continue with our agenda and uh, we'll move to item 4d um, we have a presentation uh, the 2021 artc annual report and I want to welcome uh, Patty Wilson and Susan Irvine. Uh, Patty Wilson, president of the ARTC, and uh, Susan Irvine, the treasurer. Uh, good evening, ladies. Uh, please come forward to make your presentation. Um, as I know you are aware, but just for the audience or viewers, uh, our presentations are a maximum of 10 minutes, and uh, we do ask the presenters to, uh, if they would kindly take any questions from council after your yep. presentation. No problem. I'll start. Sorry, uh, if you could just push the button again and activate the uh, the microphone. You can also tilt it down a little if you if you wish. There, we just need a red light on and on. Uh, there we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, everyone set. Okay. Good evening. My name is Patty Wilson. I'm the president of Artsy, and behind me is Susan Irvine, who is our treasurer, and Kirsten Norris, who is our director of program and communications. Okay. 2021 presented Artsy with another challenging year as a COVID pandemic continued to profoundly affect the arts and culture sector. Although many planned programs events and events had to be canceled or postponed, we continue to reimagine and adapt programming to benefit both our members and the community. Our small team was able to deliver a full roster of events and successfully celebrate a momentous milestone, the 30th anniversary of Artsy. Due to COVID, the Artsy Gallery was required to be closed until May of 2021. The gallery team reimagined a way for Artsy members to display their work in the windows of the gallery. The new Art on the Deck program provided space for artists and artisans to display and sell their work and allowed the community to safely enjoy local arts and culture. The overwhelming success of this program has resulted in Artsy adding it to our permanent programming directory. It will be offered any time that the gallery is closed. Artsy was pleased to invite arts councils and communities from across Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands to join the 2021 Sally C Week of Lanterns Festival. The community was encouraged to create and display lanterns at their homes and places of work during one week in August. Artsy was fortunate to have Wasonic Nation member Sarah Jin Jim share her beautiful octopus artwork for the festival, which was included as one of the large scale lanterns that was installed down at the band shell. The week of lanterns began as an adaptation to our annual evening lantern festival during the pandemic. But as we return to in-person celebrations, RC will continue to present the week of lanterns leading up to the in-person evening event and of course a lantern parade on the Sydney waterfront. Building on the success of the 2020 Artsy Virtual Studio Tour, Artsy once again offered our members the opportunity to create short videos sharing their work through various online channels at no charge. This program is an online ad adaption of our annual studio tour and is another example of how Artsy has managed to pivot our programming during the pandemic. These videos will remain available indefinitely on our website. RC continued to build new community and business partnerships and foster existing relationships during 2021. At the beginning of the year, RC partnered with McTavish Academy of Art, the Pier Hotel, and Beacon Community Services to offer the Festival of Hearts in honor of frontline workers and to support those living in isolation. The community was invited to decorate wooden hearts created by the McTavish Academy and provided by RC. Our partnership with Coast Capital Savings also continued to grow with members artwork being displayed both in the Sydney location and the Shelburne location. Artsy together with SBIA again presented the Sydney Art Walk and Community Christmas Tree Initiatives. The Sydney Art Walk included the work of 30 Artsy members displayed in the front windows of participating local businesses. For the community Christmas tree, RC members along with the public were invited to pick up a complimentary ornament and decorate it. The completed works were used to decorate the outdoor Christmas tree which was located in downtown Sydney. We are also thrilled to partner with our municipalities to offer a new funding stream for individual groups and organizations 
the Saanich Peninsula Arts and Culture Grant Program. Funding is available for initiatives with an arts and culture focus that are designed to benefit the residents and communities of the Saanich Peninsula. RC was excited to award, our, to award our first grants in November of 2021. It was also an exciting year for the Sydney Seaside Sculpture Walk with the addition of four sculptures added to the permanent location. Since RC assumed the revitalization of the sculpture walk, there have been seven sculptures added to the permanent collection and we are working on replacing all of the sculpture plaques. The success of artsy programming in 2021 would not have been possible without the extraordinary efforts and support of our volunteers, members, and the greater community. From a financial perspective, like all arts and culture organizations, the past two and a half years have been very challenging for artsy. To, to navigate our path through this uncertain and difficult time, the artsy board has focused on maintaining our financial viability to continue to serve our members and provide arts and culture programming for the community. We have done this by very careful management of our finances, pursuit of grant opportunities, and shorter and longer term planning, which is focused on adapting our programming. In this context, Artsy can report that it finished 2021 with a balance of $108,304, of which 54,000 of that is reserved. And in, with, we ended up with a net balance of around 45,000. The 54,000 that is reserved represents a fund set aside for the new premises as the life of the Talista building is limited. The surplus is important for budgeting purposes due to the uncertainty of revenue sources and the need to cover ongoing expenses until incoming revenue is received. We've provided an overview of the 2021 resource, revenue resources sorry, that illustrates what has contributed to the 2021 financial and the challenges of the 2022 year? As evident in the pie chart, which I think you now have, a critical factor of Artsy's positive financial position for 2021 was the one-time and unexpected COVID-related funding of 65,000, which accounted for 40% of our 2021 revenue. This consisted of the BC Arts COVID resilience supplements of 47,000, federal COVID wage subsidy funding, 12550 and a Central Saanich COVID-19 restart grant of $5,725. Also key to Artsy's ability to continue our work during the pandemic has been the maintenance of annual funding from our municipal and provincial partners, which account for 37% of our 2021 revenue. The remaining 23% of our revenue was derived from artsy generated income, including memberships, program revenue, other grants, and sponsorships and donors. Looking forward, <laughs> the board is continuing to focus on managing artsy's finances and to address our capacity challenges to ensure its sustainability in the coming years. With COVID related funding support drastically reduced this year, and likely to be discontinued going forward, RC is facing significantly lower revenues and the available savings are critical in sustaining all of our programming. Some of the measures we are taking to address revenue and operational challenges that we face are continuing to dedicate resources required to seek funding from various grant programs, which is a huge part of our um, daily life as a trying to get grants. Addressing our critical volunteer and staff capacity challenge by adding a new part-time coordinator position to assist with program membership and volunteer support. Our current employee is <laughs> at her capacity, unfortunately, <laughs> so we need to add some help. Reaching out again to local businesses for sponsorship and for donations from the public now that the pandemic conditions are easing. Reintroducing registration fees. RC subsidized registration fees for many of our programs over the past two years to support local artists and artisans during the pandemic. As programming returns to normal, registration fees will help to provide revenue that is necessary to sustain programming and operations. By taking these measures together with a careful planning and the management of our resources, RC is looking forward to having a successful year of arts and culture programming. Thank you for your time. We are very grateful for the continued support of our partners, the Town of Sydney, District of North Saanich, District of Central Saanich, and of course the Province of BC. Now. Thank you very much for your presentation. That was no problem.
pretty much bang on 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> I will turn to colleagues uh, if there are any questions. Uh, Councillor Fallow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson Levine and um, Norris. I, um, you know, I in your report, you talk about the small but mighty team uh, working tirelessly, and I, I saw that. Um, mind you from afar I didn't see it down as you were down the trenches doing your work <laughs> and you were tasked a number of years ago to start looking for other funding sources and uh, you rose to the challenge uh, I commend you on that you um, you also did something really important during the COVID when uh, the way you presented art and attracted the public needed to adapt to the restrictions of COVID and you found ways you were true artists. Uh, you went outside the box and figured out a way to do that, or ways to do that. And um, I, I know that the work that you've put on the board, you like so many other organizations are shorthanded and don't get the volunteers that you desperately need. And that takes away from your art because you're artists as well. And you're mm -hmm. volunteering at a board to assist artists and um, sort of a double-edged sword that you need to do it, but it's going to cost you time in your, your avocation, right? <laughs> and so I just wanted to say thank you very much from the town's perspective for what you do and what you've done for the town and what you do for our community. Uh, I think you, um, no, I, do, I know you are to be commended and thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Councillor Pellet. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for the report. And I really um, appreciate this handout here that you've provided in terms of the, you know, the pie chart and where the funding sources come from. It's, it's uh, r really um, good to get an idea of, of where things are coming from. And I also really appreciate how you've broken out how the funding that you received from the town was allocated to different community organization so so thank you for that um, and I'm wondering in regards to the the intake that you receive for those those grants can, can you give a rough idea of how many how many you received um, um, in terms of numbers and dollars maybe it's in the report and I missed it but um, That's a myth. It's on the back sheet. oh oh okay <laughs> so the, the other side oh okay Oh, great. Okay, super. Good. Um, and then the other thing I was just curious about, you, you talked about your, your premises that are getting a little bit too long in the tooth. Uh, and I'm wondering, first of all, how many years do you think, you know, that can hold out? And also, um, what would be sort of your ideal space in terms of size and location? <laughs> the ultimate Realis dream or reality? Realistically <laughs> speaking. Okay, um, I met actually, I can't remember, anyway, right about uh, before the pandemic hit, it was about two th early 2019, we were told we have five years left on the building. Okay. And I think we were probably really lucky because the pandemic actually, I think, extended our building a little bit because yeah. we were not open. Um, and they have come and redone the front deck, which I think will also kind of extend us a little while. They just finished that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a trailer. You know, you know, I mean, we have these problems of, we have a lot of rodents. We've had to have, you know, pay our internet redone just recently because the rodents got into the service room. Little things mm. like that, which is normal, but the building, where the building's located. Um, ideally, we did, we were asked uh, about our, our ideal dream, and we did, we did submit it to the town. Well, we have a lot of people that ask um, for classrooms. You know, we do have a lot of artists who want to give a class. Unfortunately, because we're only one room in our, basically in our gallery, we can't do that. We have art groups that want to also be able to meet, you know. So we have, I think in our, it was probably about double the size we have now. And I think, what are we at now? 1,300 square feet, I think. And I think we tried to get it under sort of 3,000, like an area that we would be able to work in, um, you know. In, our ideal thing would be to have, you know, a meeting room in that. But I mean, we don't need to have any of that. You know, we need to focus on the artists and what they need and what the community wants. They love the gallery. We have had a huge amount of people 
Um, the last student show that was in there last week, they had 250 people come through in two days. Mm. And it was Sydney, it was just the community, um, which is very nice. I mean, people are very excited that it's back. We get those comments all the time. So a gallery is first and foremost. Uh, you know, in, in studios, a lot of other communities that we have talked to, they have in-house artists, so they'll go through a month where they'll have an in-house artist that has a studio. They, people seem to like that. They love demonstrations, the community does. You know, it's just simple. We just want somewhere that the artists can come and show their work, you know, our community artists, and that's basically all we're looking for. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, thank you for the report. Thank you no for what problem. we're doing. I think... Um, the art community has a big role in helping us to all come out of the pandemic and recover what we've been through. So um, thank you for that. Yeah, we've had a lot of people that are very excited, um, and they've already started asking about the lantern, the <laughs> lantern uh, parade. So it'll be it was very nice this year. We're quite happy about that to have it back finally. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to. Councilor Rintoul. Well, uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wilson, for the presentation. Uh, congratulations to you and your board on, on the healthy financial position. And I think very prudent to be planning for the future and establishing the reserve as you have for your uh, for your premises. Uh, question, um, and I, I don't have the handout that I, I noticed, but circulated there um, minutes ago. It may be addressed in that handout further, but uh, financial statements, uh, note five, referring to grants. And this is with respect to the Peninsula municipalities uh, for your uh, grant program uh, established to support local individuals, groups, and organizations uh, with funding for arts and culture initiatives. Uh, it looks like the the, the grant um, capacity was twenty three thousand eight hundred dollars uh, that was received in twenty twenty one, and that thirty five hundred three thousand five hundred forty dollars was paid out. So was the was the was the number of applicants, if I'm reading that correctly, not what you'd anticipated? Um, was it part of just the challenging environment we've been in in terms of uh, getting uptake uh, on the grant or perhaps you could just speak to that uh, uh, and how it was received by the community? Yeah, no problem. Um, Artsy had a granting program years ago so this was actually just sort of a revitalization but what we found uh, with the first round for the November deadline of 2021 was that there was a lot of arts groups that would normally that we normally gave grants to years ago that just were not prepared to start again, uh, you know, just because of COVID. You know, so it was um, dance performances, you know, music performances, and they just were not prepared yet. This time around, we had quite a few more uh, applications, and we gave out quite a, quite a bit more money. So we knew kind of that it would be slow starting, also because of the time of year that we were up and running was November. Uh, so it was kind of even if it was a normal year, it was very late for anyone that was going to do a Christmas show. They want their funding early on. So, um, but no, we, we knew that going in that we would actually have a layover of, of money for this year for the granting program. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Rintoul. I see no further comments. I uh, want to thank Ms. Wilson and your colleagues for uh, coming and presenting this evening. Uh, I want to echo, and I think all of Council echoes, uh, the very positive comments from our liaison to the arts, um, to RC, uh, Councilor Barbara Fallot, and uh, also the remarks from Councilor, uh, other Councilors. So, thank you. Thank you. If I could have a motion to receive uh, the report, please. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, none opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. We'll now turn to uh, the bylaw section, section five, and the first is uh, bylaw number 2230, the Sydney Business Improvement Area, SBIA, uh, a bylaw, and I will turn to uh, staff for an introduction, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The um, public process for the renewal of the BIA bylaw has been undertaken and the results are in, and there is um, far short of the required opposition to prevent council from proceeding with the adoption of the uh, bylaw. Accordingly, bylaw 2230 may be adopted at this meeting to uh, ensure another five years of the BIA. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hissick. I'll turn to colleagues if there are any questions uh, on the report. Uh, seeing none, we do have a recommendation. I'll move that bylaw number 2230 to renew the Sydney Business Improvement Area be adopted. 
Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? None opposed. The motion, motion carries unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> we'll next turn to item 5B, and that is bylaw number 2234, automated vote counting system and election procedure, amendment number four. I would turn to staff for an introduction, please. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is a bit of a housekeeping item that addresses uh, some legislative changes um, associated with election procedures. And um, so it involves uh, an amendment to our election procedures bylaw number 1715. And it's basically to uh, now allow um, uh, all eligible electors that uh, can use the mail ballot option for voting as opposed to um, the select few that uh, were indicated in the uh, procedures bylaw currently. So it's a housekeeping amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Humble. I'll, I'll turn to Council if there are any questions. Uh, we can move uh, move this forward with three separate motions this evening and readings. I'll move introduction. Second. All in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. Move second reading. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Motion carries unanimous. Move third reading. Second. All in favor? And that motion carries. It will come back for it will come forward again to a f future meeting for final adoption consideration of final adoption. We'll now turn to item five C, um, bylaw number two two four zero, our official community plan. Um, certainly appreciate those in attendance this evening, those who may be watching the live web stream, um, and for the written uh, correspondence, uh, and for the presenters this evening. Um, we have a number of things to do, particularly with the, uh, with the additional correspondence and, uh, and report we have from staff. So the way we would like to proceed with this is um, we did acknowledge during uh, approval of the agenda that we have received uh, 36 pieces of correspondence. And so what uh, we would like to do in a, mo in a moment, I will ask Council for a motion to receive that correspondence. Uh, and then Council, uh, after it's moved and seconded, can discuss or address uh, particular concerns within the uh, correspondence. We would then approve receipt of that correspondence. We will then turn to a present, uh, sorry, for an introduction uh, by, Ms. by Mr. Newcomb. Um, you will see in the agenda package uh, the, his uh, staff report that was uh, circulated last Thursday um, and uh, a second report that came, a shorter report that came forward today that he can speak to. Um, and then in that second report, uh, staff are recommending, um, I believe it's nine uh, short recommendations and, and Mr. Newcomb will speak to that during his, uh, during his introduction. Council will proceed through each of those nine recommendations. Uh, and then I will turn to council uh, if they w any council member wishes to uh, move an amendment to the draft as, uh, as we have it before us this evening. After we proceed through the staff recommended uh, amendments and any amendments that council chooses to proceed with, uh, we will consider moving uh, the staff recommendation uh, for first and second reading of the bylaw. That would complete our, our work this evening. I just want to uh, I just want to uh, inform uh, the public that uh, while many will be aware that after we give first and second reading uh, to the OCP, if we proceed with giving first and second reading to the OCP bylaw, we are required under the Local Government Act to issue uh, notice over two weeks uh, in the Peninsula Review and to have a public hearing. Uh, a public hearing is, uh, is a very special uh, public engagement. Um, while during our regular par public participation meeting, or regular public participation period that we have at council meetings, and we have a limit of four minutes per speaker uh, to, uh, to quite frankly deal with the business we need to attend to, but also listen to, uh, to members of the public. A public hearing is dedicated to uh, for council to listen to members of the public, and there is no time limit on uh, the speaking time uh, for members or members of the public. So the public hearing would, uh, would then conclude and then council would consider, um, uh, possibly consider amendments, uh, but consider, uh, consider adoption. So um, we certainly wanna have uh, a deliberation tonight on the, on, the, you know, on, on the input we've had on the changes uh, and um, council will consider 
moving forward, but those are uh, the steps that we can, uh, we can proceed with uh, procedurally. Um, so I will first turn to uh, uh, seek a motion to receive all of the correspondence that was submitted with the uh, agenda. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, I'll turn to discussion. Uh, Councillor Wainwright. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, so there have been um, several different themes that have been brought up in the correspondence. And um, I guess I'm going to start out by saying that um, uh, mostly I'm seeing things that were brought up earlier in the process and are being repeated. And, um, you know, with respect, and that's great. Um, people who feel strongly about things should bring that forward. The point I, I'm making to my colleagues is I'm not perceiving anything new in the input. What I'm seeing is repeats of things that I've already heard. There are some subtle variations on that, and certainly some people have pointed out typos and things like that, which is you know, greatly appreciated. But in terms of the, the major themes, it's things like concerns about Cedarwood, 2325 Harbor Road, the environmental aspects of it, uh, implementation, and another one simply being, um, does our community need more time before we try to bring this forward to a public hearing? Those are kind of major themes that are coming out of the the latest input, and those are things that we've been hearing through the process. So I guess my point, the point I'd like to make is um, there aren't any big surprises coming forward to me today. Uh, now, I do want to pick up on some of the things that are in here, and I'm going to talk about 2325 Harbor Road, and then I'm going to stop and let other people talk about things if they want. Um, we've had a lot of concern come from the neighborhood about uh, 2325 Harbor Road changing from residential to Harbor Road Marine. And I uh, certainly appreciate those concerns. Over the years, um, we have seen conflict between the marine industrial uh, activities in the Harbor Road area and the surrounding residential. And we know we have to try to manage that. So 2325 Harbor Road is a place where currently we have residential looking right across the street at the core marine industrial area. And that is a scenario for conflict. Conflict like we've seen you know, over many years leading up to now. So I think sensible planning has us wanting to do something that minimizes future conflict. Now, right now, it hasn't been a major issue at 2325 Harbor Road because it's a very aging property. It's, you know, it's, it's definitely not a, it's not um, a prime residence. It's not, um, you wouldn't expect the tenants to be making, to be complaining a lot and it's rented out. But if somebody redevelopment it as residential, either single family or duplex, that is going to be an expensive home near the waterfront and that is exactly the scenario where you're going to get the complaints. So that's the kind of thing we're trying to avoid. And there has actually been uh, an application not that long ago to redevelop that site at a higher density that got turned down because of various concerns. At any rate, I think Council has really listened to the concerns from the surrounding residential area, and what's being proposed is that 2325 Harbor Road would be a transition between the more intensive marine industrial activities across the road and residential around it. And it would, we would, under the OCP, you'll see policies that do not allow the high noise and disturbance marine industrial activities on that site encourages something more along the lines of marine retail, marine office, with a residential component. That kind of thing would be a good transition. It would allow the property to redevelop, it would buffer the adjacent residences, and it would likely preserve property values. 
so personally i think we have listened and made a very balanced choice for this property so i'm just explaining why i'm continuing to support the harbor rain designation on that site and i think we really did listen on this one you may not agree with uh, uh, where i'm ending up on this but I think, in fairness, we have listened. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Wainwright. I'll turn to Councillor Fallot. Thank you. So I'll um, I'll pick up uh, from Councillor Wainwright's uh, discussion regarding Harbour Road, and I'm going to s uh, differ slightly uh, with the the property facing Marine Industrial. Um, I think depending upon where you're looking, the property also faces residences. Uh, looking over at the um, the inn, that's I realize it's an inn, it's a commercial property, but it's far more uh, of a residential flavor. So, um, you know, I where I do agree with uh, with what my colleague was saying is, if we leave it as residential. The likelihood is we're going to have one, maybe two units. Um, two units that either stratify, duplex, or maybe the property can be split into, I don't know, sorry, um, I shouldn't go there. It's gonna be residential. And based on the size of the property and the number of units on it, or lack of number of units, it's gonna be very expensive property. But a question to staff, we speak elsewhere in um, Harbour Road Marine Industrial that um, residential units have to sign a covenant that they are aware that this is marine in industrial. Would that same covenant apply if this were to be residential? Yes. Okay, so if we were to have one or two houses, residential units on there, they would be signing a covenant and would be just as aware that this is marine and Thank you. Sorry, Councillor Bellow, a, a point of clarification, if I might. Um, residential on the Harbour Road Marine designation, yes, would be subject to uh, a covenant. Um, the neighbourhood residential designation in the OCP would not be subject to a covenant. Okay, yeah. okay, thank you for that clarification. Okay, so that that's a slight difference then. Um, and an important one. So I wanted that, I, I saw that place as um, it should remain residential. Where I listened to the different parts of the conversation that came from staff and, and from my colleagues is if we put the type of commercial business on the main floor that is a more of an office retail as opposed to something that is uh, repair or service to the marine industry, then the interference to the peace and quiet of residential neighborhood is mitigated by that. Um, if we then put multifamily on top of it, put condos, that increases the housing stock. Um, and I think that's a gain for us is to be able to get more units. It doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be fit in a niche of level of affordability, but nevertheless, there are multiple units. So I think where perhaps we didn't do a good job in our deliberations, I'm assuming, is that we didn't explain how we were coming to that decision well enough for the residents uh, who have written back to us and say, you know, they don't understand why that decision was made. I think the decision is a good one. I'm prepared to leave it as a uh, marine industrial because of the way the property is going to be used. If, if this were a boat yard and they're repairing boats, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. But we've got enough policies that protect it and I think the intent is appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fallon. I'll turn to um, Councillor Rintoul and Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I, and I concur with, with the statements of both uh, my fellow councillors, Councillor Wainwright and Councillor Fallon. Not necessarily has anything new come to light with respect to this, uh, but that council through this process perhaps is not well articulated 
uh, you know, the intent with uh, with this particular property. Uh, but therein lies the problem. We've got a number of residents uh, who who continue to express concern, uh, despite you know the fact that we've addressed this on a number of occasions, uh, either in this forum or or Mr. Newcomb has had an opportunity to engage directly with with many of those residents as well. And and so um, I'm inclined to look at the feedback from those neighbors and and to uh, to see us uh, revert that property uh, back to neighborhood residential and the OCP. Uh, I won't move that now as I understand the process from the mayor that we'll, we'll look through the list of uh, recommendations from staff coming up and I'd be prepared to add at that time um, for further discussion by, by colleagues. But I think it's really just a matter um, of acknowledging that it, it was well intended uh, in terms of, of what um, staff and council in the process wanted to see for that property um, but it's not been about well received by the neighbors who are a little concerned about creep if you will in terms of uh, a continuation of the likes of activity of a boat yard etc uh, and there's just some concern around that and I sympathize with uh, with that anxiety that perhaps this has created so I'll leave my my comments uh, there and my intent to uh, raise that item later Mr. Mayor thank you well, thank you Councillor Antirol I'll turn to Councillor O'Keefe uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so in regards to the, the Harbour Road, um, as I th think Councillor Rintoul has uh, mentioned, is that, you know, we've tried to communicate best we can for our, our plans there, and uh, maybe that's still not clear. Having said that, I don't think it's a reason to revert it back to residential. Um, I think that the plans that we have in place um, prevent the, the sort of concerns that the residents have in terms of um, there being some sort of obnoxious build, uh, business going on there where they're gonna be grinding and painting and strong smelling things there. So um, I'm satisfied that there's enough policy available to do that and we can tighten that up in the zoning bylaw as well. I think the, um, as Councillor Fallett mentioned, there's potential to have perhaps more uh, residential units above uh, a, a, a business on the ground level, so that's a good thing. Um, and also, the reason for me to keep it as uh, as we have is um, because the marine industry is is an important part of our economy, and there's really no place for them to grow down there. And that's one of the last little parcels that would be available for some sort of accessory business that would support the marine industry. So I'm okay with it being there um, with the, the tight policy that we have to, to address the concerns that I think uh, the neighbors have. Um, in regards to just a couple other things that were brought up. Actually, uh, Councillor O'Keefe, oh, if, I, if I could interject, I appreciate you may have other okay. points, but if we do have another speaker on, on this point, okay. then we can certainly come back sure. to, uh, to other I'll turn to Councillor Garnett. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I threw you to staff. I guess I'm I'm wondering when I hear the word encourage for use, um, may be, may require amendments, may not. So our intent is to have that be that kind of use with residential above, but we may not be the council of the day. So is there or staff may not be the staff of the day? Is there potential for that use to be something other than what we're wanting to be? something the neighbors won't be comfortable with. Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Garnett. So the property is currently zoned R1, single family residential. Uh, for the property to be zoned anything else, uh, council needs to adopt a zoning bylaw. Um, what's in that zoning bylaw um, is up to the council of the day. Uh, staff, I, I think any staff person would bring forward a bylaw that is consistent with the OCP and so uh, uses such as you know grinding or painting or, or those specific uses that the policy has identified as undesirable in the OCP uh, would certainly not be included in the bylaw uh, given that it would be inconsistent with the OCP. Thank you. Thank you staff. Thank you. Thank you Mayor. Uh, thank you Councillor Garnett. I'll, um, I have a couple of questions as well. <clears throat> The intention uh, through the policy that's been created, and I appreciate that that has to be refined at the time that we uh, that the zoning is done for the for the site. 
um, that it could be a, it could be just a single story uh, marine commercial uh, building. It could be a two story uh, marine commercial, but it couldn't be larger than that, or it couldn't be higher uh, higher than that. believe the Harbor Road Marine designation does speak to between one and three stories. Yes, it does. Um, so policy 11.3.1, the Harbor Road Marine Desert designation is intended to provide land for predominantly marine industrial uses that support the maritime industry and adjacent marinas, including some limited residential development at a general scale of one to three stories. And of, and of course, as I mentioned at the previous council meeting, the one to three stories is the package, uh, the container, and then the zoning bylaw further specifies uh, maximum stories, built form, uh, setbacks, et cetera, within that container. But through the, uh, thank you, and, but through that level of policy, um, three levels of, of marine uh, commercial could, could occur, subject to what is put in the zoning bylaw. I mean, if you're permitting three stories, we then have to determine through the zoning bylaw, whether we're only going to permit marine commercial on the ground floor and only residential on the upper two stories, uh, or so I, I'm not trying to refine it to that tonight. I'm I'm trying to yes, the zoning bylaw would specify those types of things. You know, if if the council that adopts the bylaw only wants uh, marine retail, for example, as as the only commercial use on the property and only on the first floor, the bylaw could specify that. Um, and, and keep in mind as well that this policy is general to the entire Harbour Road Marine area. Um, and, you know, this is not a large property and, and there are site specific considerations that would come in with a, a redevelopment application. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, those are my questions. I'll turn to Councillor uh, Wainwright. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I w was thinking that might be appropriate for us, us to park the 2325 Harbour Road discussion till we actually have a motion. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I concur with that and if I, I don't see any further any other first time speakers so please uh, continue if you wish. Okay. Um, and I'll turn to Councillor. I, I don't know, you were speaking first and I didn't know if you wanted to come back to any of the other items you spoke. Or I'll come back eventually but I think Councillor O'Keefe had a couple of points. Certainly I'll turn to Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, so um, they were just points and I think we were, com were commenting in regards to the correspondence that we heard from okay okay so just want to clarify sure. so um some of the things that i heard and i just want to comment on was um you know several s speakers and comments about uh, the implementation and wanting um more detail on that and my understanding and maybe a, a question through you to staff to confirm my understanding is that a lot of the the implementation i understand would be um undertaken probably at our first strategic planning session in the fall that uh, we would be looking at the OCP at that time and going through that and picking out um, particular initiatives, whether it was the, the, the bioregional uh, framework, uh, whether it was live aboards, um, housing policy, more explicit housing policies, uh, some of the, uh, those sorts of things. Um, would I be correct with, with that? or And then carry that on to budget discussions as well. Uh, through the Mayor to Councillor O'Keefe, um, generally, yeah, that's, that's the process uh, for Council to bring forward priorities is through the, through the strategic plan and, and then into the budget process. Um, staff obviously act on the strategic plan uh, on an annual basis, and uh, I think there's a quarterly staff report updating progress on uh, some strategic planning items as well. Right, okay. Okay, that's, um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm satisfied with that. And then, yeah, I also heard a lot about wanting more specific detail for certain sites and that sort of thing. And again, just a question through you to confirm through staff is my understanding that those more specific guidelines and things would be handled when we get to um, reviewing the zoning bylaw. And that's where we can uh, add more detail and more specifics on what we want to see uh, in particular areas or pati particular sites. Yeah, okay. And um, I think I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Uh, 
thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. I'll um, uh, take a moment to speak with regards to implementation uh, because it was spoken to in uh, correspondence and I think uh, three or four of the speakers touched on implementation uh, addressing Council this evening. And um, I can appreciate um, I can appreciate that concern or, or that being brought forward. Here we have spent uh, some two years on developing a, a, a very a sophisticated uh, official community plan that uh, I believe is more holistic than we've seen before in, in Sydney official community plans in terms of not only addressing land use and development, but um, uh, climate change, environmental protection, transportation, uh, parks, open space, amenities, uh, and, and other areas. And um, uh, for example, one of the speakers uh, tonight mentioned about, well, where is the plan for climate action? So there is many policies in, the, in this OCP with regards to climate action. We're required to specify GHG targets. Where is the plan? Well, we hired a climate action coordinator some two years ago and uh, the Climate Action Coordinator will be making a presentation at Committee of the Whole next Monday on a full climate action plan, and that will go through a process of review uh, by Council uh, with input from the community, opportunity for input from the community, and that will become a plan. Once that becomes a plan, there are a number of options within that plan in terms of what we can do uh, to adapt and, and, uh, and mitigate climate change. Um, I'm going to revert to earlier in this term, uh, Council adopted a new um, Parks Master Plan uh, uh, strategy. Um, and that was, uh, that involves substantial um, engagement with the community that began actually towards the end of last term. And uh, when the recommendations came forward, 23 parks were reviewed, three parks were prioritized, a number of amenities were, were recommended for those parks. Uh, while no firm figures were attached to those, um, you could see several millions of dollars being expended on improvements and amenities to those particular, those three uh, priority parks. And so uh, with, with Council having approved the Parks Master Plan, our staff, our park staff and planning staff actually bring forward on an annual basis uh, something from the Parks Master Plan as a priority. That priority, if it, it, and is going to involve budget, so for example, I think we spent something like $150,000 on the upgrade of playground, or the new playground equipment in Rathdown Park. Um, that financial priority that comes out of the Parks Master Plan has to be balanced with everything else in the $25 million operating budget and the eight to $10 million capital budget that comes forward each year. So where, where I'm going in terms of giving the example of the Climate Action Plan and, and the Parks Master Plan is that I can appreciate the community um, wants to have a, a, a better sense of what the priorities might be coming out of the official community plan, but the official community plan is setting the higher level policy and we have those underlying plans or those other plans to implement and it is through our strategic planning on an annual basis and absolutely council will be having the official community plan in hand when they're doing that. And the uh, strategic planning process, given that we will have a current official community plan, not one that's 15 years old, um, we will have, it'll be a public process to do the annual strategic plan. Um, uh, community will be familiar with the official community plan and priorities, and I foresee, you know, the public coming forward and saying, let's have this as a priority. Well, Every budget, every strategic plan and every budget, we have um, more than enough good things to do to, to, to improve our community and we have to set our priorities based on staff and financial resources and that is gonna continue. So to, to expect staff and council through this process of the official community plan to say, uh, give some uh, more detailed specifics in terms of what those priorities would be, that, that, that's going to be an ongoing exercise in terms of the priorities. And while we have things on our official community plan, there are other things that come forward that staff and council have to address that aren't necessarily in the official community plan or, or in the plan. And so for example, the remediation of Ray Creek or, the, or, the, uh, or dealing with the Ray Creek Dam. Uh, they were both significant capital projects uh, that required a lot of staff time and a lot of resource. Um, 
those things have to be done because we're responsible for uh, you know, certain provincial and federal regulations and, and that sort of thing. So we do have our priorities and, and we set those priorities, but at the same time, things come forward. Uh, we know we're going to do another condition assessment at Beacon Wharf in 2023. That was the outcome of the previous engagement process. We don't know today what that condition assessment is going to say, and we don't know where that is going to inform how we set the priorities. So um, we can go into any of the topics, uh, you know, transportation, active transportation, environmentally sensitive areas, Mermaid Creek. Um, uh, yes, the, there are many, many pro uh, priorities. I think we've done uh, an excellent job because of the community engagement and because of the community input in setting the policies to cover these areas. And um, I know the community will hold our feet to the fire as we go to, uh, you know, we continue in our strategic planning and in our budget processes to make sure we're choosing the, the right priorities as, as, as we go forward. So I, I just wanted to address that in implementation because we did have several speakers and I can understand where it comes from, but we d I think we do have a, a good process to, uh, to address it. And quite frankly, I think the public, uh, yourselves and others, will keep um, the council's feet to the fire in terms of setting the right priorities as, as we go forward uh, from this community plan and from the other plans that we have, such as climate action. We're working on an active transportation plan uh, that, need, that uh, we're looking to approve by, uh, by the end of March, or first quarter of, of 2023. So uh, these, these plans uh, are, are living documents in, the, in themselves, as well as the OCP. I will leave my comments there. Um, uh, I will turn to colleagues if there are others. I'll turn to Councillor Wainwright. Um, thank you, Mayor. So one of the other things that's uh, come up in uh, uh, public participation tonight and also in the uh, correspondence on input is a concern about um, a rush to get the OCP adopted. And tonight I heard um, by July 1st. So regardless of what the magic deadline is, um, this is something I think everybody on council is, has been um, weighing. And uh, uh, I'd so it, it is a tough thing because if we had another year left in our term, I have no doubt that we would extend the, the process and have deeper uh, consultation. The factors that are um, going through my head on the other side of things are, um, well, July and August is our summer schedule, so we slow down a lot. We don't get as much done. Four months and two days from now is the next election. That is not a long time away in the time frame of having to advertise for public hearings, hold public hearings, and then get final adoption done, particularly if you're going to a slowdown in July and August. Now, undoubtedly, we'd be willing to hold special meetings, but we'd be doing it during the period of time when people are expecting to be traveling for vacations that they haven't been able to travel to do for quite a long time. So that's not a good scenario for trying to have any meaningful engagement. So if it goes past the election, what happens? Well, you are going to have a new council. There will be at least one new member because I'm not running again. After the election, um, there'll be an inaugural meeting. People will have to get appointed. There'll be an orientation. They'll have to do the strategic planning. Then they'll have to do the budget sounds like a pretty long down tools after the election before they get back to picking up the OCP. And it could be a different council. It could be like the previous council. I don't think it would be anywhere near that bad. Um, but <laughs> um, there's a risk. The current OCP is a problem. A council like the last council can do some incredible things that the community really doesn't want to have happen. We have areas of the town that we think should be in designated environmentally sensitive areas so that when development happens, there are guidelines and rules they have to follow. That's not in place. The longer it takes for us to fill those holes, the more risk. So there is some real urgency to fill those gaps. Um, I have another factor in my head, which is that 
during the election campaign, adopting a new OCP was like goal number one for me. I want to see it happen before I retire. Um, so one of the, the big factors facing me in do we go ahead with this thing is, um, is it good enough? And uh, we have put an awful lot of time into reviewing it. And there is no question there are still a bunch of typos and things that need fixing, but they're housekeeping fixing. They're not um, showstopper, really bad news type fixing. And I said it earlier, um, we've, we seem to have identified the rough spots in the OCP, and it's the same conversation coming forward about them. At the end of the day, we're, we're going to have to figure out where we land. But I don't think another year is going to help us particularly on that. So um, I think it is reasonable for us to look at adopting it. I do. And keeping in mind that there is a period of several weeks um, before the public hearing happens where people can spend more time and give us more input and get bigger petitions and whatever, um, it, you know, it's not over. And even for the really problematic areas, Cedarwood. Cedarwood is currently not zoned to allow condos. And regardless of what happens to the OCP, if somebody wants to put condos there, it'll have to get rezoned. There is yet another process <laughs> to happen under the new council, perhaps, for some of these things. Um, any, anyway, you put all that together. It is definitely a balancing act, but um, to me, plugging the loopholes in the current OCP is a very high priority, and it, it is something that uh, some haste is not unwarranted. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Winery. I, I would just like to add briefly uh, to, to Councillor Winery's comments in, in, in the sense of balance. Um, while you can look ahead and, and look at what timelines are available and the, and the factors that impact, the st really the starting point from Council and I know for staff has been, what has our process been to date? What is, what is, has the process been reasonable leading up till tonight, for example? And I think with the presentation of the, of the draft OCP back in, in, in February, uh, providing six weeks of, in, of uh, opportunity for engagement for council receiving some 300 pages of, uh, of input um, and then proceeding with, uh, with, uh, with, a re with recommendations for a redraft with that coming forward, uh, a, narrower, a narrower set of, uh, of refinements. Um, and I think uh, tonight those have been uh, uh, those have been highlighted again in terms of the Cedarwood, in terms of Harbour Road, um, in terms of implementation, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of some of, uh, of some of the other aspects that have been raised. Um, but I think, uh, on balance, that we have followed a good process, uh, and I think we have an excellent document going forward that will serve us well. Um, there will be OCP amendments that we think improve the document going forward. Um, because I think, it, as, as I think a speaker alluded to tonight, it needs to be a living document. It isn't something that we can approve in the coming weeks and then put on a shelf. It has to be a document that we uh, use on a regular basis. And if we use it on a regular basis, such as strategic plan, budgeting, staff are using it otherwise, you know, when they're, when, they're, when they're looking at the climate action plan and what to implement, they're going to be looking at the OCP in terms of those higher level policies. And, and that's what's going to inform, um, inform setting priorities. And we will look for opportunities to, uh, to improve the OCP. I have to say, from experience, we have uh, three or four municipalities working on OCPs in the capital region. Now, one of the things I did coming in this term was look at municipalities that have approved Callwood, for example, approving an OCP in the last term. And you take a look at the length of time that it takes. Now, it wasn't just COVID. I mean, COVID did impact our timelines. Our original, uh, our original target was to complete the OCP uh, at the end of December. Um, 
but um, still, even if we had completed at the end of December, that would have been, including the housing needs assessment, basically taking up the first three years of our term. And that's a long time to work on. A, it's a very important planning document, but that's a long time. And there's, there's, a, there's a many things we have to get on with in, in, uh, in, in, municipal, in our local government. And uh, I foresee the opportunity for local governments, for, for, for Sydney and, and possibly for other local governments, is that we are not going to, I would not wait for 15 years to do another comprehensive review of the OCP. Um, presenters tonight have spoken about this is a planning document for the next 20 years. It is, but, but that doesn't mean we're going to, and I know the, the, the people who made those comments didn't, didn't intend this, that we're going to wait 20 years to, you know, to do the document. We have to think that far out when we're talking about the important things that are in the OCP, whether it's development, whether it's climate action, and so on and so forth. But we need to not wait, not leave the OCP as it is for five years and do a review or whatever. We need to be thinking about how we can improve it as a living document as we go along. I'm not suggesting there's going to be amendments every six months or, 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 or what have you, but I think through the major areas of the OCP, we will see opportunity. Uh, such that whenever the next review is, whether it's five years from now or seven years from now, um, that it isn't a comprehensive review to the degree that it is today. That if we have actually set policy, you know, that, is, that, is, that looks forward as far as 10, 15, 20 years out, that we can refine that as we go along and not be in the situation we are today where we have, uh, you know, having, having taken 15 years it, it was it was a, it was a, an enormous process. I, ha I have to say that I think the public has has, uh, has appreciated that, and I know uh, staff and council have appreciated that. So, um, yeah, just just some remarks on in, in terms of the process we are in terms of looking at this. Uh, I think most people are aware because it's come out in several reports. One of the highest priorities coming out of uh, the completion of the OCP will be a review, a complete review of the zoning bylaw. Um, and that's important as well. Um, and so we do need to do that. Because why? As Councillor Wainwright indicated, whether it's the Cedarwood property or some other properties in, in, the, um, in the community, if they come forward, they can cite the OCP, but they are going to, until we complete a review of the zoning bylaw, and there will be a public engagement, there will be public hearings yeah, for that process, is um, it's gonna require an amendment to the, to the zoning bylaw. And that in itself is going to trigger an engagement in a, in a public hearing process. So, um, you know, the Local Government Act, you know, prescribes these, you know, procedures, policies and procedures for local government to operate. And I think, uh, I think we're, uh, uh, I think we've done well in our process and, and the community engagement has been excellent and, and we certainly appreciate um, your input, and, and we still have work to do tonight to address concerns that have, uh, have been brought forward most recently, or, or uh, this evening, and in the correspondence. I'll turn to Councillor uh, Councilor Garnett. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, appreciating the comments of my colleagues, and um, my take is a little different. Um, certainly, it is a document I would love to have finished by the time the term's over, but that's not my end goal the end goal is to have a document that I believe works for our community moving forward and if it takes longer it takes longer that's just my particular perspective on it if there's things that the community feels is wrong with it public hearing yes but if there's things that I'd feel I'm not comfortable with and you alluded to <laughs> Councillor Rainwright alluded to the current OCP and the dangers with it and we see that behind us if we look over our shoulders and Quite frankly, there's parts of this document where I see the same thing could happen, and I have concerns about that in terms of the fact that the previous councils have used the rationale of what's in the OCP to approve zoning amendments. So it's, it's really important that we look not necessarily into this document as a far-reaching document, but also we're not, we won't be the council of the day, and we have to have a document that allows our community to have some kind of control over a council that may not appreciate what they want so it's, it's tied into what you're saying about the current one, but I just want to make sure those same kind of things don't exist in the one we're creating now. And that's where my reservations lie. Am I able to speak on some of the other comments? or Please, please? do. Um, uh, with regards to the, the Cedarwood, I just want to uh, address the comments were made by uh, some members of the community. 
And um, I share some of the reservations. Um, originally, the, the we it came as multi-unit residential on the west portion. We switched it to residential townhouse uh, on the 30th, uh, after the 5th being the other way. And then we gave two weeks till tonight for comments from the public. And unfortunately, um, unless you watched the meeting or attended the meeting on the 30th, you would have had to wait for the and had a conversation with somebody who did, you would have had to wait for the package to come out on the 9th. And in that package, the only reference to it is in the minutes from that meeting. There's nothing in the staff report. Uh, and, and the document itself, you'd have to go to the land use page and you'd have to compare it to previous land use pages to see where the changes have been made. So I understand the problem with that and I have the same issue. Um, from my particular threshold of uh, transparency, it, it doesn't meet my mind. I can't speak to anybody else. It doesn't meet my threshold for transparency, and it doesn't meet my threshold for proper public engagement. I would have preferred to see um, a, an opportunity for people to comment more. And yes, as Councillor uh, Wayne uh, referenced, people are not bringing necessarily anything new, but we made we made a change that was new. We did something different. So I, I think we needed to allow the public a chance to absorb that and comment on that, and the fact that we did something different. Uh, and that's all for me. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I, I just want a point of clarification is, is that when the draft OCP came forward, the uh, residential side of the, uh, of the Cedarwood property was multi-unit residential. And uh, during our review of, of the comments, we gave direction to staff to refine the, um, I think it was the, the built form and, and um, of, of the property. The, the staff recommendation came back for uh, neighborhood uh, townhouse. Um, council, and, and one of the other things that occurred at that meeting was uh, a council recommendation. Councillor O'Keefe moved a recommendation to create a new land use designation of neighborhood townhouse. So neighborhood townhouse was not a designation in the first draft of the OCP that came forward. And um, I'll certainly allow Councillor O'Keefe to correct me if, 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 if I'm not uh, presenting this correctly. But in our deliberation at Council meeting with regards, the concern over creating the land use designation, or the request to create, uh, to consider a land use, a new land use designation of neighborhood townhouse was that the existing neighborhood commercial areas uh, were small, uh, and that the adjacencies to those, the properties adjacent to those existing neighborhood commercial areas were mostly single family residents or, um, uh, or, or small residential lots. Uh, and so the concern was uh, we had heard from the residents uh, in different parts of the community where there's neighborhood commercial, so over in the west side, uh, off Kenora Road where there's neighborhood commercial, on Rest Haven where there's neighborhood commercial, that, um, that there was a concern if you, you have the land designation of multi-unit residential, which allows three and four stories, they had a concern that that would allow three and four stories. The intention was not, as staff presented, this, the intention was not actually to have three and four stories in those uh, adjacent to neighborhood commercial, and that would be addressed in the zoning bylaw during review of the zoning bylaw. So we listened and we, uh, Councillor O'Keefe made the recommendation that was supported by Council for staff to look at creating a new land use designation and the land use designation of neighborhood commercial uh, came forward and one of the outcomes of that which we did not discuss was that the residential adjacent to the neighborhood commercial on the Cedarwood property became multi or became neighborhood townhouse. Quite honestly for myself, I did not, s that was not my intention if that land use designation of neighborhood commercial or neighborhood uh, townhouse was going to be created. I spoke to it last, um, Last meeting about about my feelings about about the land designation for Cedarwood, I'm going to let others speak, and we and we may come to it later on. But in terms of the process, it's not a flip flop from council. It's 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 a it's a process that we have gone through, and through that we have been tr we have been wanting to listen 
to the community in terms of what the land designation is there. You are familiar with the, the, the deliberations that we had with regards to whether or not a four story should be added to the neighborhood commercial, and we didn't do that. We didn't do that just because of the Cedarwood site. We did that because it would affect the neighborhood commercial, um, in, uh, the other neighborhood commercial areas in the, uh, in the community. So I, I just want to clarify that, that process, and, and um, uh, I'll turn to colleagues. If uh, you want to continue discussion in terms of responding to, to correspondence, uh, we can do that now, or we can proceed. We still have an introduction from Mr. Newcomb, which would I, I think Council and, and the public will benefit from, uh, and then we can come back to it. We have parked uh, 2325 Harbour Road as well. And I'll turn to uh, Councillor Rintoul. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I'll be brief knowing that uh, Mr. Newcomb has, uh, has a report for us and we have a number of uh, motions to uh, to address as part of that process. <clears throat> With respect to timeline, um, you know, I, I think it's in, incumbent on Council not only uh, to listen but to, uh, to move this uh, process forward. Uh, and we've heard uh, this evening uh, from speakers, you know, how pleased they are with the revised uh, draft. And we've heard from council in, in digesting uh, the letters and feedback today that there are a couple of themes that are still outstanding that, that people are uncomfortable with. And uh, this evening provides an opportunity to address that. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not supportive of seeing uh, staff delayed from moving forward in the next phase of this process. So once, we, once we've adopted our official community plan, as we've noted this evening, there are a number of the zoning bylaw uh, changes that this will trigger and, and a number of policy items as well and as a community um, you know I think we want to see that efficient use of our staff time following the years we've spent developing this OCP so I'm very comfortable with where we're at I'm very comfortable with the prospect of another couple of weeks before a public hearing and um, we have heard this evening particularly on Cedarwood to segue to Cedarwood uh, through uh, comments from speakers, as well as a petition um, that uh, to the mayor's comments that you know, maybe we're not flip flopping on this, but um, you know, there were different options presented at different times for the west portion of, of that Cedarwood lot. And um, certainly I would be happy to have council have a discussion on revisiting that this evening as well. But in terms of the process that the mayor sent out earlier, um, you know, I'll save that for uh, when we're dealing with the motions that are noted in uh, Staff Report 5C. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rintoul. Um, seeing no other speakers, I will now turn to, uh, sorry, we do have a motion on the floor to receive the correspondence for information. Uh, I'll, I'll, if there's no further discussion at this point, I'll call the question all in favour. Uh, the motion carries unanimous, thank you. I'll now turn to, uh, to Mr. Newcomb. Please, Mr. Newcomb, you have the floor for an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Uh, with your permission, I'll start off with the original staff report from the agenda. Please. Thank you. So this, this staff report is really about introducing the OCP bylaw. Um, and as Council knows, uh, this project has been a, is, is a four-phase project. Uh, the first phase was sort of background research and review. Uh, phase two was really about engaging with the community and, and gathering feedback. Uh, that phase culminated in the key directions report. Phase three was drafting the OCP and, and further refining it through community engagement, uh, which has been ongoing since February. And phase four is the final phase of the project and includes the bylaw readings, the public hearing, and potentially adoption. So as we move towards phase four, uh, staff have brought forward a initial OCP bylaw uh, that includes the, I guess you can call it the final draft of the OCP. Uh, this draft includes all the council direction uh, to refine the OCP up until the May 30th meeting. In addition to that, um, Council direction, uh, staff have incorporated and gone through a, a, a multi-stage um, spell check and, and uh, uh, error searching process whereby we've reviewed the document uh, both as a group and individually numerous times to uh, search out any errors or omissions in the document and we did find uh, quite a few that were corrected. Uh, no doubt there are more hiding in there. Um, that 
that's the nature of a complex document like this, I believe. Uh, I have noted in the uh, staff report four, I won't go through them in detail, but I have noted four, uh, I guess you could call them uh, more significant corrections uh, from this process. Most of the corrections we did find were minor in nature, spell, spelling errors or, or uh, missing periods, things like that. Uh, we did find a couple of, of slightly uh, more significant errors and they're listed in the staff report. Um, I, I guess the most significant of those is just a, a, an omission in terms of um, exempting single and two family dwellings from the environmentally sensitive uh, development permit areas, which was not the intent. The intent is that uh, those properties within those ESAs would be subject to the development permit guidelines. Uh, a few other policies have been added as well um, uh, in accordance with some previous council comments but not direction um, just to, uh, to hit on those topics that were discussed at previous meetings. So with that in mind, uh, staff are looking toward phase four of this project and looking at the legislative requirements that uh, the town must follow in order to adopt an OCP bylaw. Uh, Section 473 of the Local Government Act includes a number of content and process requirements uh, in, a, in developing and adopting an official community plan and staff are confident that the town has uh, fulfilled all of these requirements um, to the letter of the Act. Uh, there are also consultation requirements uh, both with um, agencies and organizations that council feels uh, uh, should be consulted during the process and, and the bulleted list of those organizations that we've been that the town has been consulting with since the start of the project are listed in the staff report. Um, that process of keeping those partners and stakeholders and, and First Nations uh, informed about the, the process that we're going through with the official community plan uh, will be ongoing until the end of the process. Uh, the town's also required to consult with the school district, uh, which we have done and fulfilled that uh, uh, part of the act as well. And beyond that, uh, section 470, 477 sorry, then moves towards uh, what are the procedures for a town to adopt an official community plan. Uh, staff's opinion is that we are, are at that stage or very close to it. And uh, the first part of that process is a first reading of the bylaw. If that first reading of the bylaw happens, there are a number of things the town must then consider, including its financial plan, any waste management plans, and we all also have some statutory referrals uh, to take care of. So if council does give uh, the bylaw first reading tonight or in the future, near future, uh, staff are prepared to undertake those items. And I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Newcomb. I'll turn to colleagues if there are any questions. Would Please. you like me to cover the second staff report as well? Uh, certainly, that would be helpful. Okay. So the second staff report, which was a late item on the agenda, uh, pertains specifically to the feedback that we received, uh, uh, the, the town received up until uh, my staff report was about 3 o'clock today. It was open until 4 o'clock today to submit comments. So there were a few comments that weren't covered in my report, but they were forwarded to council. Uh, so it covers that feedback as well as uh, a number of, I guess you could call them final corrections that staff have identified uh, that we recommend to be undertaken prior to proceeding to uh, first reading the bylaw. So looking uh, at the comments that the town received, um, as of 3.30 today, we had 30 comments come in. Uh, there was also a petition submitted with 121 signatures uh, specific to the Cedarwood Motel site. About half of these comments were also with regard to the Cedarwood Motel site. Um, two comments were specifically pertaining to 2325 Harbour Road. Uh, general uh, other item land use change comments, there were six of. Uh, two comments on environmentally sensitive area designations on properties. One comment regarding building heights in the downtown. Uh, three comments noting the need for additional multi-unit residential land in Sydney. And then there were three long form comments submitted uh, related to environmental aspects of the OCP. Um, a speaker tonight spoke to some of those as well. So just briefly commenting on the Cedarwood Motel site, um, staff note that uh, there, there, is, um, there has been a discussion at council on, on this issue and uh, 
uh, staff are prepared to take uh, council direction on this. Um, but at this time, uh, given that past uh, council discussion, staff do not have any specific recommendations uh, with regard to this site. Uh, the same holds for 2325 Harbor Road as well. Uh, the other comments, I think, as Councillor Wainwright uh, previously noted, um, uh, valid comments were made, uh, but they are comments that have been submitted in the past, uh, comments that, uh, that staff and, and likely council as well have uh, carefully considered, and uh, at this time staff are, are remain satisfied with the, uh, the draft in light of those comments. Um, regarding the long-form comments on the environmental, po environmental policy aspects of the OCP, um, I think generally speaking, staff are satisfied with the, the shape of the draft as it stands currently. Um, we do note that uh, some of the comments that were made um, are specific to uh, projects that um, you know, are, are sort of in the discussion, early discussion phases, um, but at this time staff don't feel that there's enough sort of uh, definitive information around those projects that they're worth uh, including in the OCP. And certainly that's not to say that the town might not be involved or would, you know, would not be involved in those projects. The town uh, is involved in many projects that aren't specifically listed in the OCP. Uh, one item that was brought up by uh, one of the letter writers was the idea of uh, the, the vision in the OCP lacking sort of a, um, an acknowledgement of the Sydney's place on the peninsula and Sydney's working together with partners to uh, improve things like the natural environment. And uh, the letter writer raised the fact that both um, Central Saanich and the District of North Saanich and their draft visions uh, bring up this idea of peninsula-wide collaboration with other municipalities and First Nations. And so staff have, uh, in the staff report recommendation, uh, proposed some potential wording that council may wish to consider around that point. Mr. Mayor, would you like me to go through each of the, the 10 recommendations one by one, or is council satisfied with? I think council's had a chance to review them. Um, Mr. Newcomb, we, um, we would proceed with them individually, and I think sure. at the end, uh, while they're on the floor, that uh, council could certainly ask questions. Yeah, uh, I'm more than happy to answer questions. Before we, uh, before we move. So thank you for that, thank you. Um, for that second uh, report, and I would turn to council if uh, we do have um, Ten, rec uh, ten recommendations, um, and if we could proceed with them on an individual basis. Uh, Council Wayne, right? Um, I'll start it off then. Um, I'll move that the following wording be added to the end of policy uh, 5.3.4. Lands covered by the West Side Local Area Plan are intended to provide residential uses at a scale between one to six stories as per table one land use in the local area plan. Second. Discussion? Yeah, Council and Wainwright? if I could just speak to it. Um, the uh, west side local area plan um, acknowledges the possibility of up to six stories if there is a significant affordable housing component. And since that's in the local area plan, um, it would be inconsistent not to have that in the OCP because the West Side local area plan is part of the OCP. And I'll emphasize it's only with a significant affordable housing component, and that's what the West Side local area plan says. So this is, um, this is a technical amendment to make the OCP consistent with the West Side Local Area Plan. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I'll turn to the, the seconder, Councillor Rintoul. I think Councillor Wainwright has provided the rationale. These are housekeeping uh, uh, recommendations, so I'm happy to support it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Um, I'm going to make a comment, um, and uh, it is something that has not come up, um, has not been, been brought forward um, in recent correspondence, and, and that is um, in terms of the local area plan, which was passed in the previous council term um, and amended.
added to the OCP, so it is it is currently part of as part of the current OCP and is carried over into the uh, into this uh, new revised OCP. Is um, six stories, and um, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm not going to propose an amendment. Um, I think the deliberation we or the engagement we've had with the community uh, community and the direction that we are taking in terms of five stories in uh, the west section of downtown, uh, the downtown business district uh, being to five stories if there is a significant uh, affordable housing uh, component. Appreciating that that is, that is part of the, uh, of the one to six stories, uh, I feel five stories would be more consistent uh, in the west side local area plan. Um, However, that plan has been in place um, and we have not had substantial comment on that uh, through, uh, through the engagement process. Uh, Councillor Garnett. Thank you, Mayor. I just uh, was something actually I was going to bring up as well. I echo those comments. I, uh, I'm not comfortable with six stories in that area as well. So um, I'm not sure where to go with it, mind you. Um, if this is even the place to address it, maybe later on after we go through the rest of the, uh, or is this now the time we should? Uh, as Councillor Wainwright has, has highlighted and staff have highlighted, this this particular policy amendment is to make the OCP consistent with the with the yep. West, uh, with uh, with West Lap. Thank you. I see no further uh, discussion. I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed. We have one opposed, Councillor Fallot. Uh, the motion carries. Uh, Councillor Wainwright? Yeah. <coughs> uh, moving on then, I'll move that the following wording be added to the end of policy 21.6, brackets, note a building permit may still be required, close brackets. Second. Uh, any discussion? As seeing none, I'll, I'll call the question all in favor. Uh, the motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll move that policy 5.3.5 uh, 5 be amended so that it reads as follows. Lot areas specified in this section are intended as a minimum baseline only. Minimum lot areas in the town zoning bylaw should also take into account the neighborhood context and environmental, social, and other relevant policy objectives of the town. Second. Second, uh, Councilor Wayne. Um, this one was strictly to um, clarify the intent of the lot areas that were specified in the OCP. Uh, there had been a conversion from units um, per hectare um, that triggered this getting put in. So this uh, hopefully is clearer wording. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Uh, none opposed, the motion carries. Okay, moving into the very typo. Um, I'll move that the list in section 23.2 be amended from ENC to ENF. Second. I'll call the question all in favor. Motion carries. I'll move that the list in section 24.2 be amended from A, B, and C to H, I, and J. Second. Call a question all in favor. The motion carries. I'll move that the list in section 25.2 be amended from E and D to E and F. Second. All in favor. The motion carries. Okay, next one. I'll move that the Mermaid Creek ESA be denoted in a hatch pattern on map four. Second. Uh, Council Wayne? Yeah, speaking to that one. When we extended the Mermaid Creek ESA, which is a solid green color, and made it overlap the Roberts Bay ESA, which is a solid, I think it's light purple color, where they overlap, it becomes a new color that's not in the legend, and that's not a good thing. So turning it into a hatch pattern fixes that. Thank you, uh, Councilor Wainwright. Uh, I'll call the question all in favor. I'm not opposed, the motion carries. Okay, next one. I'll move that policy 23.4.20 be amended so that it reads as follows. West Side, West Sydney streets must be designed in accordance with the direction outlined in the West Side Local Area Plan, C sections D4 street typologies and D6 
transportation design direction gallery to enhance streetscapes and accommodate sidewalks, crosswalks, greening, beautification, and stormwater management. Second. Uh, Councilor Ryan. So to explain this one, uh, in the draft there is a header for 23.4.20 and then there is a list that has only one element in it. So a section A, no section B. So this amendment <laughs> re rewards the paragraph so it's all one paragraph and not a list with only one item. The wording is otherwise the same. It's just no longer a list with only one item. It's a paragraph. Thank you. We'll call a question all in favor. None opposed. The motion carries. Okay. Um, I'll move that and semicolon, sorry, comma and semicolon be added to the end of policy 24.2B. Second. Call a question all in favor. None opposed. Motion carries. Okay. And finally, I'll move that the vision statement be amended by adding the following sentence at the end. Partnerships across the Saanich Peninsula work to improve the social, environmental, and economic connections that sustain the community and its region. Second. Uh, discussion? Uh, I just want to thank, uh, I, I thank for the public input that uh, led us to that, uh, that addition. I'll call the question all in favor. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you. That concludes the uh, 10 recommendations uh, presented in the second staff report. Uh, I'll now turn to council and council. We've had some, uh, we've had uh, significant discussion with regards to 2325 Harbour Road. We did have an indication, I believe, from Councilor Rentoul that he may have a motion coming forward. I would suggest we address that and then I would suggest we go uh, and have further discussion and possible resolution with regards to the Cedarwood and we can carry on from there. Uh, Councilor Rentoul, you have the floor. Thank you, Mayor. I'll move that the Harbour Road Marine designation at 2325 Harbour Road be changed to neighborhood residential. Second. Moved and seconded, uh, Councillor Wintour. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. We I think we had considerable discussion on this item um, earlier. Um, I think my only remaining comments would be that you know we had we chatted that the, perhaps we'd heard from colleagues that um, you know this is one of the last remaining uh, parcels that could be converted uh, for this type of use. We're seeing a fairly significant undertaking at the site of the, the former uh, Blue Peter pub uh, which is providing a, a lot of opportunity given the design that's been put forward there for for smaller businesses and for uh, businesses to operate in that marine zone so I, I, I feel like we've certainly uh, helped facilitate opportunity in that area through um, that development as it potentially moves forward and the only other comment I'd be would be that the um, the designation as is um, Harbor Road Marine uh, and the, the the possibility that there would be you know residential on the second story uh, of of a new development at this particular location, uh, it, it kind of it counters to the argument that um, we're concerned about a future residence being built there or the current residence being built there and and their um, you know quality of life being affected by um, you know a, a neighboring boat works for example um so I, I don't i don't see how we would be addressing uh, that to a future residents uh, potential uh, satisfaction either so that is uh, that's a concern with respect to that element of the discussion that i have and i think uh, most importantly we're, we're just not seeing the support from the uh, from the immediate residents um, they're concerned and this has created anxiety despite i think you know staff's best efforts and, and efforts at council uh, to look at what was intended there um, it's created anxiety and that's that's unintended so um, uh, I'm happy to support the motion I put forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Rintoul. I'll turn to the seconder. And no comment, uh, Councillor Wainwright. Um, I think we've already had a pretty good discussion about this, but the comment I'd make is that um, the the structure currently at 2325 Harbour Road doesn't have that much life left in it, so it is going to redevelop within the time frame of the OCP, like definitely within the time frame. We've already seen an application come forward for it to redevelop that got turned down uh, by the previous council. So um, whatever is done 
uh, the neighborhood's going to be living with uh, for quite a long time. And if it's residential, that's going to be a high-end residence. Um, I, I just think we would be better off trying to avoid the conflict. With respect to residential on the second floor, if it looks out to the south towards the residential area and does not look out towards Harbor Road, I don't see how that is contributing to residential conflict with the Harbor Road industrial. But anyway, I, I think we've said everything to say and we probably should just vote on it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Wainwright. Um, not seeing further discussion, I do have uh, points that I, uh, I left till now to, uh, to make. I will support the, uh, the recommendation. Um, I was uh, triggered by the photographs uh, provided by uh, one of the uh, one of the residents who submitted correspondence uh, in terms of different site locations. And while I walk uh, through that neighborhood on a regular basis, um, if you are to uh, take an aerial view and think of a circle, um, uh, it's, I believe, less than 45 degrees of that circle that you would be looking at current marine uses. That is the Philbrook's Broat Yard and the, uh, the um, out of water facility they have to bring uh, large vessels uh, and the, um, uh, the Van Al Marina uh, works yard which has a gated area and, the, and the, there's a transportation device that brings them across and, and that sort of thing. But the majority of that circle is uh, neighboring residential and um, while I can appreciate that um, uh, uh, staff have brought forward and, and council has spoken to the concern over uh, potential future conflict with residential and marine use. Uh, our council and uh, previous councils, but our council has approved residential above marine uses on Harbor Road on the former restaurant site. And um, the folks who move into that are going to be fully aware of, of, uh, of, of what, they, uh, what they will be surrounded with in, in terms of their living. And so I think that um, another aspect to this, and, and it was part of my, uh, my, my earlier questioning about the number of stories and the uses on the different floors, is that uh, if it is one to three stories, and if it's a three-story development and there's ground for, for example, marine retail, which is not going to have grinding and smells and all the things of concern, and there's upper story residences, that's going to create a parking, uh, you know, a parking demand. And um, it'll be a challenging site. There'll be a lot of activity going back and forth. And I can see neighboring residential having concern over, over that. Um, so I, I think um, given that there is residential above marine uses on Harbor Road, um, and I think given the majority of what surrounds the, um, uh, the current site is residential, I granted the, uh, the, um, the inn across the way is not uh, um, is not residential, but it has a residential feel in terms of the design of the building and the uh, and the uh, landscaping um, that is there um, and the use of the property. Um, and so those are my um, those are my reasons for supporting uh, the motion on the floor. I'll turn to Councillor Fallon. Thank you. Uh, there was a, a word that one of my colleagues used earlier that I hadn't thought of, and that was encroaching. Um, the commercial encroaching onto the residential. And that one sort of sat there and, as another colleague of mine likes to say, percolated around. Um, I think for, if I'm looking at it as being residents, uh, residential units on top of commercial, I'm, I'm good with that. But the idea that um, this is another property that is then encroaching onto residential by having the commercial downstairs is, is something that spoke to me. And I think, uh, although I had said earlier that I was willing to support the existing uh, designation that we have currently, um, I'm going to support the motion uh, that is before us right now, and that is to go to com residential. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn to Councillor Garnett, then Councillor O'Keefe, then Councillor Duncan. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I uh, concur with uh, uh, Councillor Fallot and, and the Mayor. Uh, I just, 
I, I, I don't worry too much about the conflict aspect of it because I think you can design the property to mitigate that. And there's this beautiful thing called trees and shrubbery. There's things you can put up that would that would lessen the view and actually help promote a more livable part of that community. So uh, I'll, I'll support the motion on the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. So I, I initially uh, was in favor of uh, changing, keeping this as, as marine, but um, Mayor made a, a good point that kind of uh, resonated with me in terms of the uh, the parking. So something I never uh, considered in terms of um, if we have businesses there and residences above, um, that's going to to create a parking issue, and I can see that being more of an impact for the surrounding residents, even though they're sort of low impact, uh, say retail businesses on the ground floor. I could see how that would have an impact. So. Um, Considering that, I, I think I'm uh, inclined to support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. I'll turn to Councillor Duncan. Thanks. I'll be voting against the motion. I think we discussed this one earlier, and my rationale is the same. By having commercial on the bottom, we know this site, as Councillor Wayne has pointed out, is going to redevelop. The only thing that anyone left in the world has money to redevelop is probably going to be some high-end mansion. Um, by having commercial on the bottom, there's ever so slightly more likely a chance we'll actually get some sort of residential that we actually need. I'm not concerned about the parking because I know what the gas prices are, and we know that we're going to be heading into one whopper of a recession, which will probably last for at least the rest of this OCP timeline. And I don't think there'll be many people who will be living in the kind of apartments that would exist above a commercial area in an industrial area who will be having cars. So I'm not terribly concerned about that. Thank you, Councillor. Looking, I don't see any further discussion. I'll call the question all in favour. Opposed? So Councillor Wainwright and Councillor Dunklin are opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, and if we could turn uh, to um, the Cedarwood. Uh, Councillor Wintoul. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I'll move that the multi-unit residential designation of the Cedarwood Motel site be changed to neighborhood townhouse. Second. Moved and seconded. Councillor Rintoul. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. So I, I recognize that we've had this uh, this discussion uh, with sort of various uh, options for this, this large property. Um, Certainly, the feedback uh, that came before us at this meeting, uh, we, you know, is, is certainly very personal to, to many residents. Uh, I think we all understand that and appreciate that, and 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 sympathize with helping to want to sort of mitigate uh, the, the level of of change that happens at this uh, site. I, the neighborhood the townhouse um, is is certainly a lower density option. And I think it's still going to add very significantly to the housing stock in Sydney. When you look at, at the property that's there now and that it's got no housing and then it's a, it's a hotel, um, this is uh, a significant accomplishment, I think, in terms of <clears throat> potentially adding uh, housing stock on this large property uh, and, it, and it keeps with it um, the approach that's suggested here, sort of that, that phased, uh, approach where we'll see uh, continue to see the designation of neighborhood commercial uh, essentially in front uh, stepping uh, down somewhat to the um, to the neighborhood townhouse if this uh, motion moves forward uh, so I'll, I'll leave my comments there thank you mayor well, thank you councillor uh, Rintoul I'll turn to the seconder thank you um, I, I certainly appreciate um, all the correspondence that uh, came through to address this and uh, to to my colleagues and others that um, I discussed um, the different points about the Cedarwood site. It's a unique site in our community because of the, that it's a commercial site that is um, it just sort of flows in our community. It's got a wonderful garden. Uh, I'm going to miss that garden when the day comes that um, it goes. Um, and then I thought about, so uh, what is the difference between having uh, multi-unit residential and townhouse? 
Um, if we were to keep it to three story for the multi unit, uh, then you know it's a fairly similar size to the height, maybe half a floor taller. And it was the massing. It's it's the massing that um, a condo project, condo building, even if you did multiple units buildings in there uh, to break down, it still is a lot. And then when I look at that, the other part is it is a lot more people. And I think as much as it is perhaps for 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 a, a council and for uh, the community to think, well, we need housing, we need to create more units. I think we also have to think about the other parts that is written throughout our OCP, and that is that new developments, new structures blend and fit in with the surrounding area. And I think if we were to put um, condo building is in there, I think that would be a stark contrast um, and that one would be difficult to swallow. It's going to still be a big change when with townhouses, but I believe that the impact will feel more in keeping with the rest of that community. Um, and so for me, I'm happy to support this. I think this is the right direction to go. I appreciate that I've had the time to think about this and the process, and I appreciate um, the feedback and the input from the community to look at the different angles of it. It's helped me process this, and I think by going in uh, and looking at this as townhouses is a better option for this property. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you, Councillor Fallot. I'll turn to Councillor uh, Garnett. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I concur with many of the what's been thoughts have been expressed by Councillor Fallot and, and Councillor Rintoul. I just want to point to page 24 of the OCP, OCP under residential lands. And if you look at 5.2.1, it states to ensure housing densities and height are compatible with the context of the surrounding neighborhoods. And under 5.2.6, to respect the scale and character of existing residential areas. So I think that fits in really well with the townhouse component and not with the, uh, the potential for a four-story condo building um, in terms of the lower houses on Muriel and the ones that, that bordered on Lockside and then it, even the ones across the street on Wider. Um, and I, I appreciate some of the co some of the letters we received about affordable housing and uh, Councillor O'Keefe's mentioned but as well. G given the site, I don't think as much as I'd like to dream that it can happen, I don't see that how that does happen on this particular site. Um, I don't think that there's going to be these are going to be homes for entry or mid-level people. Um, it just doesn't fit with the price of housing in that particular area. Um, but I, I do I want the idea of a transition, as as Councillor Rintu spoke to. You got the commercial neighborhood commercial, and that's the intent of it. You have that plus a, a bit a bit of storage of house condos on top, and then you you phase into the to the already existing single-family neighborhoods, and it, it's a it's a it's a better blend, and it will it'll suit the neighborhood better. And uh, it will be less imposing, as Councillor Fallot spoke to. So, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Garnett. <coughs> I'll turn to Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. So, I I I won't support uh, the motion uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, first, as was previously mentioned, this was already multi-unit residential. It was a bit of a fluke that it ended up being a zoned townhouse. It was not the intention and so we're putting it back to, to what it was originally. Um, the things that, that are on, in my mind on this is again the, the critical need there, that there is for housing in our, our community and um, we've heard that from the chamber that there's not like people who are, are doctors and, and uh, policemen even can't, can't find there's, there's not housing here for them. Um, we're in a critical uh, housing shortage, and I don't know that people realize that. Like, all of us here are fortunate to have a house. I would bet that all of the letters we receive from people, well, they stated in them, um, I've lived here, I have a house here. And so that's great that we have the privilege to, to have property, that, a place to live. But what resonates with me is the people that want to have a place to live and want to live here and they can't because there's no place for them. 
So I've known at least uh, two senior women who have had to move out of Sydney because they couldn't find a place to live. My kids and their classmate who grew up in Sydney, they went to Sydney Elementary in North Saanich and Parkland. They're millennials now. A lot of them still living in their basements, not mine, fortunately. But, you know, what I think people are missing the point on is that although our population hasn't increased a lot, our housing needs have changed significantly. So you have somebody like me, and there's lots of me's around that are baby boomers that had a couple of millennial kids. And so my house used to house three people. So now it just houses one. And um, there's two other people out there looking for housing. And multiply that by thousands of times around um, the, the CRD region. So, so that's in what's in my mind when I look at this. And yes, I know that there's um, impacts to the neighborhood, but I feel strongly that we, we need to find a way to make space for people, to welcome people. We, yes, it's going to be inconvenient. The house beside me was developed, and they put up a great big, you know, bigger thing, and I wasn't too happy about it at the time. But, you know, I've come to realize that we have to start making space for people. Um, and so that's why I think uh, we, 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 need to, we need to go ahead with this. Um, in terms of comments that, well, there's no point doing it anyways because they're not going to be affordable anyhow. It's pointless. Um, well, if we take that attitude, you know, don't build anything. It's, it's just not a logical way to proceed. And so the, the one thing, if you've read about, uh, you know, the housing crisis, and it's something that I've spent a lot of time on, doing research and, and that sort of thing. And having supply is, is important. And it might not be right now at the price we want it, but we have to do our part as local government. We don't have uh, a lot of control of some of the other factors in terms of supply. But we have the opportunity to, um, uh, through, through zoning and through things like this, to, to create it. Um, let's see if there's anything else that I haven't covered. Anyways, oh, the other thing I think that's worth mentioning is, so the federal government and provincial government are making pots of money available for affo affordable housing. And when they go to divvy up that money, they're going to be looking for developments that they can support for affordable housing that have got, um, th that have some densification for it. So th they're not likely to approve necessarily a townhouse uh, complex, but they're likely to approve um, something that has more density. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I, it's not that I, I'm not listening to the concerns um, from Peter, people in the Cedarwood area. I guess what I'm asking us to do as a community to recognize the desperate situation that we have with housing. And we have to find a way to make room for others. So that's my plea. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. Not seeing other speakers, I will, um, I will provide my comments um, and elaborate uh, on some of the remarks I made at the last council meeting in support of the multi-unit residential and I'm still considering at the moment. We have had uh, considerable public input on this uh, right from the beginning because it's been a w uh, the community has been aware for some time that the Cedarwood, uh, the current owners of the Cedarwood property want to, uh, want to redevelop. And I think um, the first thing I'd like to do is address um, many comments in the correspondence that we received, or uh, the comment that was, is uh, was uh, made several times in the correspondence we received that council has been under the is uh, unduly influenced by the developer who has presented a project to uh, the neighborhood community the Cedarwood neighborhood community uh, to be clear as I stated last council meeting um, the proponent has not submitted uh, plans to the town and a process has not started by which uh, that plan or any other plan for the site uh, would come before council. 
So while the proponent held an in-person uh, public meeting and a virtual public meeting uh, and presented a design, which I understand was five stories in places, uh, had X number of units, um, I can appreciate how the, uh, the neighborhood had concern uh, over that massing, uh, over those heights, over the implications uh, that, um, that that density might have had on the, uh, on the infrastructure and otherwise in, in the community. That was a process that the developer undertook. It, is it was a process not part of the town process. Um, it, happened to be ha it happened to occur at the time that we are considering the official community plan. The responsibility of council in, in, in choosing land designations or approving land designations, and there are 12 different land designations if I've got the number right, um, in, in, the, in the plan, is to think of the community at large and what, is, what, are the, what are the needs within the community and what is compatible. It says repeatedly in the OCP that our neighborhoods, when you're introducing additional density or you're making changes, is that they have to be compatible. I understand how uh, in the past uh, changes that have occurred, uh, residents have had concern about that compatibility. Um, <clears throat> and we've had uh, input as, as late as this evening saying we want more specificity in the OCP such that we are not at that risk in the future. Um, I think council has been responsible this term in terms of how it is, um, in how, is, it, how, is it, how it is addressed uh, uh, developments and how we, how we deliberate and speak to items and that we have listened and we, under, we understand and appreciate the concerns in the community about compatibility and livability within neighborhoods. So I, I, I disagree with the comments that have been made that council has been, under, is, 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 uh, been unduly influenced by a developer proposal. We, uh, from my perspective, when I'm considering the land designation for the Cedarwood, I am not thinking about a proposal, ideas that have been talked about for the last 10 years. I'm thinking about, and I know my colleagues are thinking about, I know staff is thinking about this when the, and, the, and the consultant is thinking about, is you're developing policies that will allow uh, and lead to, to compatible neighborhoods. So for a moment, let's leave that development aside. It's not something council has considered or council is considering when we're amending, when we're, when we're doing this OCP. We're saying what should we do on that property? What is reasonable? And I can appreciate that we've had the discussion about neighborhood commercial and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, we've, I think we've deliberated and, and won't be coming back to that. Uh, it's it's uh, you know limited to three stories. Um, but in terms of the residential component, this is a three and a half acre site. Um, I'm challenged to, to, to be aware of another three hour save site. I, I, I suppose the, uh, the former North Sandwich Middle School might have ranked up there in terms of, um, I think there was some 40 uh, small lot homes that went when that property was redeveloped from a school to a small life site. That subdivision has worked out very, very well, I think, for the, for the community. Um, you could say, well, why don't we just take one of those and put that on the Cedarwood? Y things have to be in context in particular neighborhoods. And that is waterfront property. Um, and um, the existing neighborhood, it's appreciated the existing neighborhood. Um, so I, I think I've made my point with regards to we're not unduly influenced by a proposal that was presented to the community. We are considering this as if there is no proposal because we don't have a proposal before us and we want to do what is in the best interest of the community. Having said that, you're looking at a three and a half acre site. One of the comments I, made, I started to make at the last meeting was that um, we had a police report, uh, or, or sorry, we had a, um, a report from uh, a Fire Chief uh, uh, Mickelson um, with regards to, um, to additional resources to our, uh, to our uh, response time in the, in the fire department. 
And one of the, one of the um, pieces of information that was provided is that we currently have just over 120 three-story and four-story buildings, apartment and condo buildings in Sydney today. The Blue Water, am I get, is that the correct name? The, the Blue Water was built in 1964 as a three-story unit on Weiler across from the Cedarwood Hotel. Our community has evolved to have livable communities with three and four story buildings in neighborhoods adjacent to duplexes, adjacent to single family residences. The challenge is, is to get it right when a development proposal comes forward on the Cedarwood. And I, I, and I, several have come to me, have come to council and said, well, then put more specificity in, into the Cedarwood. There are limitations in, in terms of what we are going to specify uh, in the OCP in terms of what can, what can occur on the... Um, uh, Councillor Garnett read two of the most relevant policies in terms of creating a compatible neighbourhood, and those policies are intentional in, in, in the OCP. Those policies would be applied if there was a multi-unit residential unit, or uh, sorry, multi-unit residential applied to the Cedarwood. The point I want to make is it's a unique site on its size, and you can have you could have a three or, or you could have a four-story building, or some four-story buildings in the center of that three and a half acres, and based on the surrounding townhouse residential or neighborhood commercial. Given the size of that site, going down Weiler, or going down Lockside Drive, four stories is not going to be out of place. I don't believe four stories is going to be out of place in our community, just as it is not out of place in the several other neighborhoods where we have four-story buildings um, in, in residential neighborhoods. So I, I appreciate a petition of, of 120 uh, people. I appreciate all the people that have come forward to me, uh, to me directly. But I believe that with this OCP and with what is in it for it, and that if we give it multi-unit residential that we can go we can have a development come forward that will be acceptable to the community I can tell you that with any major development that is that happens in in the community you do not get a hundred percent we do not get a hundred percent support for it and so and so I appreciate that even if we go forward we, we won't necessarily we won't get a hundred percent support but we will we will have public engagement we will we will go through a process where we find uh, the right thing for that site for this community. Um, it's, been alluded, it's been referred to earlier in this meeting. Given the process that we're required under the Local Government Act, after we complete the official community plan, we have to, to complete the uh, a review of the zoning bylaw. A development is likely, I don't know, but a development on the Cedarwood site is likely to come forward to, count to, to the town and to council prior to the zoning being completed. I'm just, in that hypothetical situation, a rezoning application is going to have to be submitted and that has the highest level, of, triggers the highest level of public engagement in terms of a public hearing. So, you know, the, some of the comments we've had in correspondence that, you know, by giving this designation, we're approving this development. Uh, we're not. There is still a process to go forward, a, 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 um, a very thorough process to go forward with this. So I, I understand where the community is, from, uh, is coming from in terms of the concerns and the circumstances of what's been presented to the community and, 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 and so forth. But going forward, I think uh, we had a housing needs assessment. The province requires every local government to do a housing needs assessment prior to doing a comprehensive review of its community plan. We did that. We had 29 or 30 recommendations come forward and we have to consider being more compact as we, uh, as we, uh, as we densify gradually uh, in our community. Wanting to maintain our small town and seaside character and wanting to have compatible, uh, compatible neighborhoods. So um, those are my comments. I do have a question through to staff uh, that I meant to ask at the outset, and that is, with the neighborhood 
townhouse designation of two and a half stories. We know, we've had projects come forward on Lockside Drive, we've had projects come forward in the in Orchard neighborhood, which is, uh, which has, uh, is permitted two and a half stories, and flood control level immediately impacts those. And we can assume it will impact it on the Cedarwood site. How, if, if we provide a two and a half story designation, which, which for everybody, I think most people understand, it means that you actually have three stories, but half of the first story is below grade. That's, that's two and a half stories. So if we have, we, we know we're going to have to address flood control level, how are we doing that within the OCP? I know we've made reference to flood control level, but if you're saying two and a half stories, is, is that realistic to say two and a half stories? Um, you know, for neighborhood townhouse, when realistically it's going to have to be three stories. I'll turn to staff. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I mean, there's a number of ways that an issue like that could be addressed. Uh, I'm not sure what the elevation of the Cedarwood site is. It's, it's obviously fairly close to the ocean, so it may present some problems in that regard. Um, the, I guess, briefly two ways to address it. One is, is to raise the property, um, which is possible under the bylaw through a, a process with a, a a professional engineer um, looking at what is a safe level of construction. Um, and then there's uh, another possibility which is to uh, provide a variance under the bylaw to uh, permit the elevation of the property to be raised up so that it's out of a, a hazardous flood area. Um, so there are ways to address that. It's, it's through a council uh, discretionary process if if there's amendments to be made to the bylaw or variances to the bylaw to uh, to allow that process so it would have to come through council okay so if, if the land designation was a uh, neighborhood townhouse two and a half stories um, and, a, and, a, and a proponent comes forward and wants to do three uh, wants to do three stories will that trigger a um, will that trigger an OCP amendment or require an OCP amendment? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, if we uh, if the, if we gave uh, approved the land designation of neighborhood townhouse two and a half, which is two and a half stories under the description in the OCP, um, knowing that half of a half of a story is is below grade, um, if a proponent came forward with three stories that we have to call three stories because the three stories are above ground. We're not, it's not two and a half stories, it's three stories because the three stories are above ground. Does that trigger an OCP, uh, the requirement for an OCP amendment? Uh, so what the Local Government Act requires is that a bylaw adopted by a council be consistent with the OCP. Um, the development, va development variance permit process is not a bylaw adoption process. So council could, as we discussed at the last meeting, council could adopt a bylaw that allows two and a half stories with a certain density uh, associated with that two and a half story built form, uh, and then subsequently vary the bylaw to allow for the need to, for example, raise the building out of the ground further to avoid flood risk. So no, it would not uh, trigger an OCP amendment necessarily. Thank you. I see Ms. Verhagen. Uh, good evening, Ms. Verhagen. Good evening. Um, if I could add to Mr. Newcomb's comments about developments in low-lying areas and how flood hazard is mitigated through design, just to speak to the option that he mentioned of there being two options, one is to raise the grade of the property, one is to raise the grade of the building itself. So the option of raising the grade of the property and keeping the actual number of stories as measured from the new exists or the new grade, the finished grade, as determined by an engineer, that would not require a variance. That would be considered to meet bylaw requirements if that grade is set by an engineer and recommended to meet flood hazard. The option of pulling the building up out of the ground and leaving the grade as is, that would need the variance. So that would come to council for consideration. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Mr. Hagen. Uh, my last comment I'll, I'll make is I know there's concern, it, it came out in the correspondence, uh, it's come out through the, uh, through the OCP engagement process, is that um, 
you know, whatever is, whatever is approved there, uh, tr flood control level is going to trigger higher buildings versus what is currently there. That, um, that is a consideration in terms of compatibility within the neighborhood. But we have to remember that the existing structures there, whether it's the Blue Water built in 64 or whether it's single family residences that built in, in previous decades, when they are rebuilt, they are going to have to um, uh, take into account flood control level as well. So that, it, you know, decades from now, it's going to be a, compa a more compatible neighborhood, all, you know, with, uh, with many properties having accounted for flood control level. This is a reality of climate change and, and that we have to deal with. Flood control level is, is reasonably imposed on local governments by the province as a consideration. Um, I'll leave my comments there. I'll turn to uh, other, other speakers. Um, not seeing any fir other first time speakers, I'll turn to Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple other things to, to that I wanted to add. Um, in terms of there's discussion about uh, affordability and obviously concern about that but if we limit this to townhouse only they will be expensive um, it's just fact of life that um, the more units that they can put in on on that uh, three three acre site it will bring down the overall cost um, and I don't know why you're shaking your head at that, Councillor Garnett, but, but it, you, if you talk to people who are involved in that, it's just a fact of life. If you have, if you have more units on, uh, on, on an area, the, over, the overall price of construction and, and the land is going to be impacted. And I guess my other point is, um, as the mayor indicated, we still have a lot of flexibility in terms of what we approve there. Um, we, we don't have to approve something that's four stories. Um, I get the point about concern about the massing on the site, but I think the mayor's explained that there's ways that we can, we can deal with that. And so what I'm hoping is that we kind of, th there's such a, a huge opportunity here for us to provide much needed housing. And I hate that we would completely uh, close the door to even considering options on that site. So we can s still uh, leave it as it is, as multi-unit, and if something comes along and we don't like what they've proposed because of the massing and that sort of thing, we still have the opportunity to say no. So I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Keefe, and, and we do appreciate your comments. Uh, out of respect uh, for council, council members for each other, it, it, it would just ask that we we not make reference to other uh, other council uh, councillors while we're making our comments. Um, thank you. I'll turn to Councillor Garnett. Thank you, Mayor. I, I, the only thing I would say with regards to um, the affordability issue and more units makes cheaper. I just haven't seen it in our community, and I just have to look across the street and penthouse units in a building that they gave extra density to, selling for over a million dollars. So I. I I don't know if that's just something developers throw out there and say that that's the way it's supposed to work. Maybe it should work that way, but it isn't working that way. So that's why I based that argument. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. I'll turn to Councillor Fallon. Thank you. Um, also about affordability. Um, I, I certainly understand the rationale that um, more pieces of the pie, uh, theoretically, each piece is going to be less expensive. Uh, because there's a certain base rate you start with and um, that gets divvy up. I appreciate that. However, until senior levels of government come along with their purse, we're not going to see the type of housing, the gap that we currently have in our municipality and on the peninsula. And that gap is only going to be, that's not going to be satisfied by a for-profit developer. That is their right to make a profit. That is their business, and they are entitled to do that. They are not going to build um, affordable units. They can build cheaper units, and they can build more expensive, but that's not necessarily going to equate to affordability. Affordability requires senior levels of government to come along with their checkbook. And we've got 
the locations elsewhere in our community where we can do the massing. I don't I don't believe for a minute that increasing units on the Cedarwood site is going to provide the housing that the, the gap of the housing that we need. However, having said that, the comment that we're going to get more units if we do multi-unit, absolutely we're going to get more units. But I think even if we built a thousand units, we're not going to have enough. It, there's just, we need to do what we need to do, and, and I, I inter appreciate that we have a role within the Capital Regional District that we have to satisfy a certain amount of housing, and it's really fascinating to read the various letters and emails that come along, and people say, you know, I've lived here, I came here four years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, I moved from... And I tell you, all the people that are moving in here and the traffic, et cetera, et cetera, I'm thinking, but you just finished saying that you just moved here a few years ago. And at what point do we say, you know, this is where the line is, this is how many people we're going to have in our community. We also say we need doctors, we need medical staff, we need lab staff, we know that the RCMP is, um, you know, needing recruits and they need places to live, we need to provide it. I'm belaboring the point here. I don't believe going multi-family, multi-unit on the Cedarwood is going to solve all of the problems. It's not supposed to solve all the problems, but I don't think it's going to solve all of those problems. And I think the townhouse is a reasonable option. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing no further speakers, um, we have a motion on the floor, uh, and I will call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Uh, Councillor Duncan, Councillor Keith, and myself are opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. Are there any other motions, uh, councillors would like to, or any other considerations, councillors would, councillors would like to bring forward with regards to amendments to the uh, councillor Fallon? Thank you. Uh, first of all, if I may through you, I'll turn to staff. Um, and this is in regards to 9.23 and 10.26. And I spoke about it last time, Mr. Mr. Newcomb. And uh, that was to include the, the phrase and Beacon Avenue West. Um, and so when I look at, I'll just quickly open this so I can get the quote right. So. Under Airport Commercial 9.23, says to improve the visual image of commercial areas visible from Highway 17 and ensure that their future development provides an enhanced gateway into Sydney, including high quality landscaping. I had um, asked if we could not include or that we include the, t the words and Beacon Avenue West, and it wasn't in here. So, is there a reason or is it oversight or? Was that a, a really well thought out staff? Uh, through the mayor to Councillor Fallot, um, I, I did uh, address those comments that you made with regard to those two policies. Um, I, I'm just wondering if the minutes record the specific comment about Beacon Avenue West because I essentially went off the, the council resolutions that were in the minutes. So uh, if the resolutions didn't include that, I may have so missed it. I didn't make a motion on that because I assumed, and one should never assume, that you picked up what my intent was and that <coughs> it was going to happen. I, I also recall on a, a few occasions uh, indicating that I would pick up on those verbal comments and make those changes. I can't remember if that is one of them, but uh, okay. So it, may it, I it's make It's an a easy motion? amendment. We're, sure. we're best by motion. Okay. Please, Councillor Fell. So uh, the first motion is that nine point two point three be amended to read to improve the visual image of commercial areas visible from Highway 17 and Beacon Avenue West 
and ensure that their future development provides an enhanced gateway into Sydney, including high quality landscaping. Second. Further discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? None opposed. The motion carries. Okay. And on the same vein, 10.2.6, which for the audience is West Side Industrial, to improve the visual image, uh, to amend the 10.26 to read, to improve the visual image of industrial areas visible from Highway 17 and Beacon Avenue West and ensure that their future development provides an enhanced gateway into Sydney, including high quality landscaping. Second. Uh, discussion? All in favor? None opposed, the motion carries. And then there was a general statement Pardon me, I should have flagged this. It's 25.11.14, oh, there we are. 25.11.14, and that is, um, I was talking about site design, and the phrase is properties abutting uh, Highway 17, etc., etc. So I would like to amend 25.11.14 or 25.11.14 to read, properties abutting Highway 17 and Beacon Avenue West should provide a landscaped buffer abutting the multi-use path and the flight path. Uh, and, uh, and, and the highway, should that also then say and Beacon Avenue West? to provide visual interest and environmental benefits. Sorry, could you read that one more time, please, Councilor? Okay, so properties abutting Highway 17 and Beacon Avenue West should provide a landscaped buffer abutting the multi-use path and the flight path and Beacon Avenue West and highway to provide visual interest and environmental benefits. Do we have a seconder? Second for discussion. Second for discussion. Councillor, just before you motivate further, if you wish, a, a question is, is, is flight path relevant in this motion? Given you're talking about Highway 17 and... Um, Beacon Avenue West. And Beacon Avenue West? The flight path is across the street from Beacon Avenue West? So Beacon Avenue, or sorry, the flight path is, for instance, I'm, I'm thinking of the project uh, that uh, the proposal we've got before us, the West Side Industrial, the one that's just by um, Titan Boats, just east of tight, uh, Titan Boats. And so there is the flight path there. If I may, Mr. Mayor, uh, just suggest that the wording be something like abutting multi-use pathways, uh, which would take into account both the highway pathway as well as the flight path. Okay. If, if that's clear, then. Um, abutting multi-use pathways. Councilor Wainwright. Um, it, if I could. Yeah. This is in the section which is uh, the general industrial guidelines. So it's not going to apply to the multi-residential along Beacon Avenue West, because mm. that's not industrial. Yeah. And it's not going to apply to West Sydney Village, because that's not industrial. It's only going to apply to the northern part um, along the highway, oh. okay. or uh, you know Nicholson, that general area, <coughs> which is also not on Beacon Avenue West. So I don't, I think, you might be interested in a similar kind of landscape buffer for the multi-unit residential ad abutting Beacon Avenue West, but I don't think it belongs in the industrial. Okay, then I will withdraw that motion. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, and I have one more that um, I would like to address, and that is 6.3.4 Downtown Commercial and the, the drawing that we've got, and, and I had brought this up the last time, is that 
Section C, Beacon Avenue, three-story max, I would like to see that finger go right up to the highway so that the properties that are, I, as I'm going through there, I see that we're talking about three-story and then the, so, but I would like that really clear that those, that finger in that diagram, C, that that gets extended so that the buildings that are right on Beacon Avenue are three stories in height. Um, my concern is when we come into Sydney from the highway, I don't want to be looking, sorry, I, sh I shouldn't personalize. The vision for Sydney should not be four and possibly five stories right in that corridor. I understand that we're going to do it on the to the north and to the south, away from Beacon Avenue, but I would like to see the corridor of Beacon Avenue to be a three-story corridor. And I would like to see that specified in our OCP that that is a clear direction. Do you have a motion to put forward, Councillor? So I'm going to um, just pop them paper clips all over the place here, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. My apologies. So. If I could turn to staff for just a moment. Um, we could pass a motion with regards to the map and it doesn't pertain to, it doesn't pertain to a, a require a, a, an amendment to an existing policy. Yeah, I believe that's correct, the map. And the motion could be specific to the map only. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think, sorry, I'll let you finish motivating and then I'll, I'll come. So, so a motion to change the map. So a motion to change the, the map so that section C, which is Beacon Avenue, three-story max, be extended, that corridor be extended right up to the highway. So to bisect uh, section A, downtown west. Through the entire section A is what you through entire section A, it doesn't yep. necessarily go right to the highway. Just as a point of clarification, yep. if I might, Mr. Mayor, um, the north side of C uh, will extend, so the south side of C will hit um, the highway border just on the far side of the Mary Winspear Center. The north side will hit uh, the highway considerably further west yep. uh, out at the Dollarama. So uh, just to clarify that the line should go all the way and not stop at sort of the Mary Winspear Center's location. Well, it would, if looking at the map, it would, um, on, this, on the south side, it would stop, you know, at the Mary Winspear Center because your zone A is there, but it would continue on, these, on the north side because of the extension of Beacon Avenue. So the intent is where the, say, McDonald's, Dollarama, that property currently is, uh, the frontage of that would be three stories as well. So the, the, the south side would um, stop before Barry Winspear. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. So we have that moved as Second. a seconder. I moved and seconded uh, for the deliberation. No, I think that's clear. I, I just would... Um, I would just like to see that that corridor is is consistent and um, that that's our entrance. So I will leave my comments there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I will just uh, I will comment uh, that I support uh, this change. I, th I think it's uh, quite frankly consistent with the policies with uh, that exist within the OCP um, for uh, for Beacon Avenue, uh, and that is still permitting. Uh, in the other uh, areas, uh, the area A uh, north of C and the area A uh, for up to five stories, uh, four stories up to five stories if there's significant affordable uh, housing component. Uh, seeing no further speakers, I'll call the question all in favor. Uh, the motion carries unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Uh, just just a point on Councillor Fallett's uh, previous comment about adding Beacon Avenue West to those policies. So the down, uh, 
the, the resolution that came out of that last council meeting was to add the same policy to the residential section to encompass the multi-unit residential. So that policy reads the same without Beacon Avenue West. And I believe that was a point of concern of yours. So yep. uh, if you did want to add Beacon Avenue West to that policy that we've added to multi-unit residential, uh, a motion yes. that would be appreciated as well. A motion, but he said. <laughs> Can we have a seconder to what he said? Second. <laughs> seconder by count, seconded by Councillor Garnett. Thank you, uh, Mr. Newcomb. Thank you, Mr. Newcomb, yes. I'll call the question all in favor. Uh, the motion carries unanimous. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, that does it for me now. Thank you, Councillor Pellet. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. I uh, just have one minor editorial thing, uh, maybe a question through you to staff. So it had, uh, it related to the terminology persons with special needs and I th as I looked through the document it looked like you had gone and changed most but there was there was one left in there so I didn't know if um, you just missed that one and that you would change that it's at um, on page 28 5.3.39 so whether you need, need a motion for that or whether that was just one that got missed. Yeah, it looks like there's another reference to special persons with special needs on page 24 under 527 as oh, well. Oh, right, yeah. So uh, it was just to, I think my comment that I had emailed was to change that. Change those references to persons with disabilities? Yeah, yeah, just because that terminology, special needs, it's not one that's commonly used anymore. Um, there's not a standard definition for it. And just it, it aligns better with the Accessibility BC Act. That's a terminology that they use. Councillor O'Keefe, if, if, you, if you could make a motion to change uh, in um, okay. in the places where it is in the in the OCP to change okay, the, so from I'll the first move, term to the second term. Okay, so I'll move that we change uh, the terminology persons with special needs where it appears in the OCP to persons with disabilities. Second. Uh, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? And none opposed, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, Councillor Garnett. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a question through you to staff. On, on page seven under the uh, engagement activities and community input, um, stakeholder interviews, 11 stakeholder groups interviewed, and then down below it says it again. Is that, is the, were those different interviews or the, is that line just in there twice? Uh, there were some stakeholder interviews uh, in phase one of the project and then further on in phase three there were also some uh, additional interviews but the recurrence of that number 11 leads me to believe it's a uh, typo. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Garnett. Uh, Council, um, do we have any further uh, topics to, uh, to raise for discussion or possible amendment to the OCP? Uh, seeing none, we, we do have a, stack, a staff recommendation from Mr. Newcomb's first report uh, with regards to uh, consideration of giving first and second readings. I'll move the recommendation that the official community plan bylaw number 2240 be given first reading. Second. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Councillor Wintoul, second. I'll turn to the mover, seconder, and then Councillor Wainwright. Yeah. Okay, you're good. Councillor Wainwright. I was going to suggest that uh, we say, as amended, be given first reading. Right? Yes, thank you. As amended, thank you. Thank you. That's important. I'll, I'll call the question. All in favor? Uh, the motion carries unanimous. I'll move second reading and that staff be directed to advertise for a public hearing. Uh, we'll, we'll, second. We'll just do second, and then we'll do. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Move second reading. Moved in second. second. Yep. Thank you. Uh, discussion. Seeing none, I'll call uh, Councillor Wintoul. No. Nope. Uh, call the question. All in favor. Uh, the motion carries unanimous. And I'll move that staff be directed to advertise for a public hearing. In second. Discussion. Call the question. All in favor. The motion carries unanimous. Thank you, Councillor Fallot. Uh, Councillor Wainwright. Um, question through you to staff. Um, now that uh, staff have been directed to uh, advertise for a public hearing, when would that public hearing likely occur? Mr. Humble. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councillor Wainwright. Um, so um, we would likely look to bring forward um, the um, procedural aspects of the bylaw in terms of dealing with uh, compliance with the financial plan and the waste uh, management plan. Um, look to do that uh, at a special um, council meeting that would be looking to schedule for uh, June 20th. And um, if, um, if that, uh, um, if those elements are approved, then we would look to uh, uh, likely schedule it for June 27th. Uh, thank you. Um, a question through to staff is, um, so we cannot, we would not advertise for a public hearing until we've completed the meeting on June 20th? No, we would proceed with advertising um, right away. Okay, thank yeah. you. Council Wainer? Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, I do note the time uh, this evening and we do have several items on the agenda. Um, I am going to, as we proceed through the agenda, uh, cover the business, uh, cover items that I think uh, uh, Council uh, uh, for time sensitivity or otherwise should uh, address this evening and uh, I will be recommending or putting before council consideration of referral to the um, to the uh, June 20th meeting uh, special council meeting that um, Mr. Humble referred to so um, I am next turning to adoption of minutes we have those from the regular council meeting of May 24th move adoption second any errors omissions or we'll just wait a moment here Call the question all in favor. Uh, that motion carries. Thank you. And we have the uh, minutes from our special council meeting of May 30th, 2022. So moved. <laughs> Second. All in favor. Uh, none opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. We have uh, business not completed at a previous meeting. Uh, item 8A is development permit application number DPM00043. It's a DP minor at 9840 Fifth Street to remove a single bus bench on the north exterior of the property. Uh, this is being referred to because we had a uh, split vote which uh, could not move the motion forward in, in either uh, direction at the last meeting. We do have a council of seven this evening and can consider it. Um, I, do, um, I, I do actually want to, uh, to make a comment um, and then um, actually I, I'll, I'll put forward a motion I'm, I've taken a slightly different perspective to this, and that is the applicant requested that the removal of the uh, of one of the two benches. And we had substantial deliberation at the previous council meeting in terms of the pros and cons of doing that. Um, rather than consideration as to whether or not a bench should be removed, I think the consideration should be is should we request staff provide a certain distance from the doorway um, to where the seating begins. And so I'm going to make a motion and I will speak to it if it's seconded. Um, and that is that staff be directed to provide a five foot clearance uh, to the side, uh, to amend the, the current benches to provide a five foot clearance from the uh, from the doorway, and I will speak. I will motivate to that if there's a seconder. One second. So there's approximately 16 feet there, and um, the two benches are each six feet long, uh, which is 12 feet. If the benches were put immediately together and immediately to the west wall, uh, it would leave approximately four feet. Um, and so um, what I did is I've gone to the other two, uh, council, will, council will recall that I made reference to the two bus uh, shelters at the corner of Beacon and Fifth, uh, the one on the southbound and the one northbound, and that the one on the um, northbound uh, side outside the Toronto Dominion Bank, um, there is a six foot bench and then there is a f just 
about a four foot clearance or just slightly more than a four foot clearance. So that bus shelter, that bus stop has been designed to have a six foot bench and to have a four foot clearance beside it within the shelter. My presumption is, as I spoke last, is, is that that has been provided to allow people with mobility devices to be able to go into the shelter and be beside the bench or if they choose to stand. If we go to the bus shelter that is on the south side, there is a six foot bench and then there's a three foot bench and then there is a four foot space, a space of at least four feet. Again, I presume with the same intention of allowing a person with a mobility device or otherwise to stand to those benches. We do know that those two bus stops, uh, particularly the one going southbound into Victoria, are amongst our busiest bus stops in Sydney. Uh, and that um, while there is additional space there, that transit stop has um, a six foot bench, a three foot bench and four feet of space. We can basically provide a six foot bench, a four or five foot bench and a five foot clearance to that doorway because of the 16 feet that is there. You would have 11 feet of bench and you have five foot of clearance to the doorway. So m hence my motion that we request staff to provide five foot of clearance to the right of the doorway. Why have I suggested five feet instead of four feet, which is provided at the two transit stops? I think that is a unique location in terms of having uh, uh, an egress and a potential access egress to a going concern of, of a business and I think the additional foot is there and that you are ac we are still actually providing more than one and a half bench space uh, which is what we've provided at, uh, at another one of our busiest transit stops uh, in Sydney. I'll leave my remarks there and open it for dis other discussion. Uh, Councillor Fallon. Thank you. Um, frankly, I'm a little surprised that a simple item like this that <laughs> we're dealing with it at a, yet another council meeting or another meeting. Um, I just, we've read from the staff report that um, the tenants in that building, the owners in that building signed a covenant knowing that there is a bus stop there. So that isn't news. I was going to move the recommendation and that staff be directed to move the two benches over to the west as far as possible within that alcove. I don't know how many uh, feet that gives, but it gives ample room. I've also confirmed with staff that there is nothing in uh, the building code or and we certainly have heard nothing from uh, the fire department that there is concern that the uh, doorway is um, blocked or obstructed in any way. I think this is, um, I mean, this, this uh, individual has come forward before a couple of years ago looking for essentially the same thing. I just think that we just simply need to move the existing benches over a foot or whatever it is and deny the application to remove one bench. Thank you Councillor Fallot. I'll turn to Councillor Garnett. Thank you Mayor. Uh, I actually took a measuring tape out there. Um, so if everything was moved over by my calculations, we gain 45 and 3 quarter inches, which is approximately 3.81 feet, which I think is ample room. And so I will not support the recommendation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Winnick and Councillor O'Keefe. Um, I was uh, prepared to vote for the application being denied. And uh, the things that I'm thinking about, um, the reason that the proponents had to apply for um, this, uh, you know, minor permit is because the development permit for that building required those things to be in there. So um, the motion that's being proposed goes from we didn't pay for those benches but they're ours we get to do what we want with them to we're now about to pay for replacing a bench. Um, and I, I, Sorry. I just don't see that. Sorry, well, we're, if, we're not paying for replacing a bench. If the motion was for staff to do that then it, w it would seem to me that um, I guess we're either telling the proponent, no, your application is not approved, try this one, or we're saying, um, staff, please go do this. I, I'm okay with the, your application is not approved. I'd, I'd be happy to stop there. If they want to come forward with a different application that 
replaces one of the benches with a smaller one? I don't know. I, I guess I'd probably be open to that. But um, I, I do agree with the comment. There's a lot of time going into this. And I think that a reasonable compromise is simply moving the benches as far as you can. So I, I'm not prepared to uh, spend a lot more time on this. Uh, Councillor, thank you, Councillor Wainwright. Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. I'm al also not in fav favor of this motion, um, as one of my colleagues mentioned. So we, we've been here before, and I'm concerned that we're spending more time having to talk about this issue again. So I reviewed the when this came forward uh, a year ago. I think it even came forward maybe in 2018 as well. And at the time, um, it was more to do with um, there's people smoking there and they're putting butts and there's public urination and there's garbage around there. And so that, that was the issue. They also talked about possible violations of the fire code. Um, at the last time, they suggested that the town could potentially be at risk for being sued, uh, which I found quite remarkable. If there were to be uh, an emergency incident and people were injured because they couldn't evacuate the building, um, I find I I find it uh, yeah difficult. I guess those things, especially when you know if it really was a safety concern about the egress and egress of that building. Um, I think again of the picture that they showed of debris and stuff outside that door. Um, and so if they're concerned, that concerned about th that, I would have thought um, they should start on the inside. The other thing in terms of, uh, it seems like the, uh, the, the issue now is being that people with mobility issues need this space. Well, in nothing that we've seen before is people with no mobility issues clogging up that space. The, the picture that they gave was a guy standing there. Um, in the event that people had to evacuate that building, it's a simple open the door, uh, can you let us out? So I don't see that it's, it's an issue. In terms of, you know, I think what the issue here, it's not necessarily the bench. I think they're annoyed. There's a bit of, of an, an annoyance having a bus stop right outside. And so I'm inclined to just deny it um, right now. It's, it's something that's been there for a while they knew that there was going to be a bus stop there. <coughs> and what I'm thinking more about is that we had a presentation from BC Transit in the past year, and they're talking about improved services and different transit hubs. And they talked about possible um, transit hub at 7th and Bevan. And so what I'm thinking is let's just leave things the way they are for now, and if there's opportunity when we're discussing with BC Transit um, about how we're going to maybe reroute things around Sydney, um, that's, that's the time. Th the thing I'm concerned also about uh, restricting the size of the bench is the thing that's different about this spot that I know there's other uh, transit spots mentioned, but what's unique about this one is it is a interchange where seven buses, bus routes converge there. And for five out of the seven, it's a layover spot. So it's a place where you need seating for people to sit. And so that's why I'm not in favor of even reducing the size of the bench. If you want to move it over, I guess. But I guess, you know, I, I'm thinking we're spending way too much staff time and town, town time to accommodate what I think is a minor annoyance. You know, I, I'm just going to make a comment about the council comment or about comments that we're spending too much time on this. It was due to a split vote that this has come back before council. That is circumstance. Uh, I'll leave my comment there. Uh, and with regards to a mobility device, a photograph was provided with a mobility device blocking the doorway. I'll, I'll leave my comment there. Um, seeing no further speakers, I'll call the question. All in favor. Opposed? Uh, Councillor Garnett, Councillor uh, Fallett, Councillor Wainwright, Councillor O'Keefe, who opposed, the motion is defeated.
I have a motion uh, that development permit application number DPM 00043 minor be denied and that staff be directed to move the two benches as far to the west within that alcove as possible. Second. I'll call the question all in favor. Opposed. Motion carries. We'll move to uh, item 8B and I'll turn to Mr. Humble for an introduction, please. It's the Victoria Airport Authority Development Referral. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, at the uh, May 24th Council meeting, uh, Council received the uh, and deliberated on the referral from the airport regarding uh, the proposed development at 2065 Beacon Avenue West. At the meeting, um, Council um, uh, made a number of uh, uh, motions regarding comments to provide to the VAA. There were 10 or so. And uh, the last one was that um, um, the uh, development referral from the VA be brought back to count at the next council meeting on June 13th for consideration for further recommendations. Uh, so that's uh, before council uh, this evening. Uh, there was some discussion about the VA potentially commenting or providing additional comment on uh, uses or potential tenants associated with uh, development. Um, even though a letter went out to the VA uh, requesting additional information, uh, they haven't provided uh, any additional information in writing. So uh, we just have now uh, the consideration for Council on any further recommendations uh, that uh, uh, we uh, Council wishes the VA to consider regarding that development referral. Thank you, Mr. Humble. I will turn to councillors if they have any motions, additional motions to make with regards to the referral. Uh, seeing none, if uh, I'll turn to staff. Uh, uh, Mr. Humble, would you, um, would it be appropriate to pass a motion that um, we advise uh, the VAA that we have no further recommendations? Um, I, I would suggest that um, it's probably it's probably uh, um, uh, not necessary. If uh, if there were further recommendations coming forward, we would provide them to them. We've uh, provided the list as is, so I think uh, I think that uh, it uh, it's fine the way it is. Thank you. Uh, I will turn to colleagues uh, just one more time. Um, seeing no. Um, no speaker, I will move to the next uh, agenda item, uh, which is the mayor's report. I'll be very brief. The CRD board highlights from May. I will just note uh, presented annual reports uh, for the, um, well, let me just turn to it quickly here. It, provi it provided the CRD annual report and it provided the, um, uh, provided the um, annual report for one of the other boards and also I believe the um, Solid Waste uh, Annual Report and the Climate Action Annual Report. Um, uh, just a, a comment that uh, these reports are, are very comprehensive and I think for those um, who may not follow the CRD uh, in its business on a regular basis that uh, these documents are a great starting point or a great reference to see the good work uh, that the CRD is doing. Um, its annual report you know, would be similar to the Town of Sydney's annual report uh, and those other uh, climate action reports. Uh, with that, I will move a, uh, I'll move a motion to receive for information. So moved. Any discussion? All in favor? Uh, the motion carries. Uh, Councillor Garnett, just in, in light of time, I don't know if your report had any time sensitivity to it, but would you be willing to move it, uh, refer it to the uh, next Monday's meeting? Um, we do have some item. We do have items. We. I can do uh, please proceed. Thank you, um, thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, <clears throat> the last board me meeting was on May 31st. I will try to speak quickly, but not too quickly. Uh, as of June 2nd, masks are now optional at the center. I think that's important for people to know. Um, the, set you, the center has an amazing group of volunteers, and they've now put up a volunteer recognition board in the, in the, to show appreciation for them. Their abalone recently celebrated their 20th birthday, and they had a cake for that, and that, they were pretty excited about that. Uh, of importance to fishes formerly, the, ex the exhibit has been extended until Labor Day, September 5th. I uh, encourage everyone to take that in. It's an excellent educational opportunity for local First Nations history. 
Uh, net income for the uh, for the center is expected to be forty thousand dollars, which is far better than the plan minus thirty seven thousand. And in, in that, it's important to note that uh, that it also includes thirty five thousand dollars of capital investment work that was carried out. So, the financial position was even better. Uh, just under fifty seven thousand visitors to the center last year. Um, and pre pandemic, if people can remember, the average usually seventy thousand. So, tremendous numbers. In their 22-23 uh, plan, they're talking about resumption of school field trips in the fall of 2022. Uh, financial outlook is for a break-even budget uh, before capital investment of $55,000 for infrastructure on the feature gallery, animal life support, and IT. Uh, the expenses will be carefully managed and the time considered ca considering cash flow and the overall performance of the center. At the end of the year, 22-23 uh, fiscal year, uh, they had worked with town staff, probably Mr. Hissick, I imagine, uh, about carrying an operating reserve fund and a capital reserve fund, and they plan to have the, to maintain the level of a $200,000 operating reserve fund at the end of the year, and the capital reserve fund, which has been newly created, should be just under $154,000, and that's the plan. Um, uh, the last price increase for the uh, Shaw Centre was in 2019-2020, which was approximately 2% which was the first one they had in a long time. Um, I just want to put throw that out there to people that they are not proposing any increases and given inflation and the cost of living, that this is a, a very affordable uh, op attraction and educational opportunity for the community. And and uh, also if, you are, if you're considering that, um, memberships are also a good way to go. They say that those are paid within less than three visits. So if you're a regular visitor of the museum and you have family come into town or grandchildren, it's a, a viable option for you. Uh, and they will be remaining open six days for the, uh, per week for the majority of the year, with the exception of 2023 spring break, which they uh, feel they'll be open for seven days a week, all things considered. And that's the end of my report. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I could have a motion to receive the uh, Move receive. report. Second. Uh, any discussion? Call a question all in favor. Uh, the motion carries unanimous. Uh, thank you, Councillor Garnett. I'll uh, now turn to um, item uh, committee reports, item 12A, and I'll turn to Councillor O'Keefe, who was chair of our committee of the whole meeting on June 6th. I'll uh, move receipt of the, uh, the minutes. Second. Any errors or omissions, discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, the motion carries. Please continue, Councillor. And the uh, committee, the, the first recommendation um, is that the applicant, in, uh, so this is in regards to the property at 2370, 2372, 2374 Oakville Avenue, that the applicant redesigned plans for development permit application DP100834 and development variant application number DV100318 for the properties at 2370, 2372, and 2374 Oakville in order to retain the protected deodor cedar tree located on the site and submit revised plans along with an updated arborist report and tree retention plan that makes recommendations for tree protection during development. Second. Uh, discussion? Seeing that, uh, Councillor... Uh, okay. Thank you. Councillor if, I, if I may, through you to staff, does that mean with the revised plans that the plans would come back to Council? <coughs> through, to, uh, through the Mayor to Councillor Fallett. So, um, I think that uh, speaks to uh, um, recommendation R2. So maybe um, I might mm -hmm. let uh, Councillor O'Keefe actually um, um, speak to that first. And, uh, and if necessary, I can provide clarification afterwards. So uh, thank you, Mr. Humble. I, I think um, you know, we do see the following recommendation, but I, uh, but I think council can go either way uh, after this recommendation. We do have another recommendation that speaks to speaks to the direction, but uh, but we're not limiting which, what we can do by passing this motion. Okay. Um, I'll call the question. All in favor? Uh, the motion carries unanimous. So th the second motion, as written by staff, they've inserted the words, the redesigned development permit application number. So that wasn't in the original motion. But I'll read that in now, and then if Council wants to have discussion on that further, uh, we can do that. So the recommendation is that the redesigned development permit application number 
DP100834 and development variance permit application number DV100318 for the properties at 2370, 2372, and 2374 Oakville be forwarded to the Advisory Planning Commission for review and comment. Second. Second, I'll turn to Mr. Humble. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So based on that, um, uh, typically in a, in, a, in a scenario or a situation like this, um, it would, uh, you would see um, the, the, uh, the proposal go direct to APC and not come back to a committee of the whole. So unless, uh, unless council wants um, it to happen differently, in other words, uh, come back to a committee of the whole, uh, prior to the redesign going to APC, but typically uh, you would see it go direct to APC without coming back to Committee of the Whole. Thank you, Mr. Humble. Councillor Pellet. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to support this if it will go directly to APC. Um, not knowing what that redesign looks like, um, I would like it to come across our desk first uh, before sending it to, uh, to APC. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, a question through you to staff. So is my understanding correct that even though it goes directly to APC, that it's going to come back to Council again anyways for, for approval? Well, that's correct. So the um, ultimately the recommendations that come out of APC will come back to, uh, to Council for uh, review and consideration. So Council will... will uh, be reviewing the application again once uh, once it's seen by APC. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I'll turn to Councillor Garner. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I, I'm along the lines with Councillor Fallot, just simply because I think I think it's important for APC to have to hear our discussion and our ideas around a, a, a proposal when it's been redesigned, and I think that helps uh, to stimulate discussion amongst them as well. So I, I, I think it's an important step to uh, to consider. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Garner. I'll turn to Councillor Wainwright. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, through you to staff, if the motion to refer it to APC is defeated, um, but we've done motion number one requiring the redesign, would it automatically come back to Council or Committee of the Whole, or would we need a motion to refer it to Committee of the Whole? Like, is it just enough to defeat this motion, or will we have to make a new one afterwards? If this is defeated, yeah, maybe uh, if it is defeated, um, then um, then make a, a subsequent motion to come back to committee of the whole to make it clear. And further to that question, um, council could uh, could determine whether it wanted to come back to committee of the whole or to council, or would you have a recommendation? I mean, they, yeah, it could come back to council or committee of the whole. Um, council should uh, specify. Typically, um, um, when you're reviewing development applications and uh, if it involves a presentation, um, you know, for consistency's sake, uh, uh, typically it would be committee of the whole okay. versus council. Certainly. Thank you. Okay, so we have the motion on the floor. We've uh, had a couple of speakers to the motion. Are there any further speakers? Uh, seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Councillor Garnett, Councillor uh, Councillor Garnett, and Councillor Fallot are opposed. The motion carries. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Okay, and the final recommendation is that staff provide the proponent with an arborist report on the protection and pres preservation of the deodor tree for their consideration during their consideration of redesign. Second. Discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? None opposed, the motion carries. Uh, thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, I'll turn to item 12B, which is the Advisory Planning Commission meeting of June 7th. I'll turn to our liaison, Councillor Rintoul. And I'll refer to uh, my alternate, uh, Councillor Wainwright. That's the second time I've done that, and I will apologize once again, uh, Councillor Wainwright. I'll move that the minutes be received. Second. Any errors, omissions, or discussion? All in favor? The motion carries, thank you. We have one item of correspondence uh, related to the APC minutes, uh, so I'll move receipt of information. Second. Uh, discussion, all in favor? 
And I oppose the motion carries. Okay. And there's one recommendation coming out of APC, and uh, I'll move that uh, development permit application number DP100832 uh, to permit construction of a four-story mixed-use commercial residential building for the property at 9700 Third Street be approved subject to the following that the property owner shall prior to the issuance of the building permit pay to the town a deposit in the amount of 115 percent of the estimated cost to complete the hard and soft landscaping for the development. Second. Discussion? Uh, Councillor Garnett? Uh, thank you Mary. I, uh, I'll be voting against this similar to the rationale for the previous um, um, one as well. It's just we were presented with something there was variances then we were told that it wasn't the actual plan and so there was something else that was supposed to go to APC and then uh, and then another version altogether went to APC so I've still yet to see the actual final the final version of this uh, this plan so I don't like the fact that we we're left out of the loop through it all so that's just where I stand thank you mayor thank you councillor Garnett uh, councillor Wainwright um, thank you mayor I um, I appreciate the comments uh, the APC package, including the complete set of plans, is on the, the website, um, so they are available to anyone who wanted to look at them. Uh, APC did a pretty thorough job on this one, and in the redesign of the development, the proponent reduced the floor space for the commercial. Didn't make a lot of other changes, but just reduced the floor space for the commercial so it no longer needed as much parking and there's therefore no variances required. So this became a straight development permit. Um, there, uh, APC had a pretty lively discussion. I think that there were differing opinions about um, the aesthetics of design, but uh, at the end of the day, they did not um, recommend any conditions except take the deposit for the landscaping, and the majority liked it. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. Uh, thank you. I, I have some questions. That I'm not sure if uh, Councillor Wainwright or, or staff might um, address them, but I do want to talk a bit about uh, the parking because, well, we have we have a letter from uh, a neighbouring uh, business about it, and I have some questions as well in terms of, I guess, first of all, I'm trying to get a better understanding of um, the the use for the area so the there's these two sculpture gardens um so the actual uh space has been reduced but are they still planning to use those sculpture gardens as they as a as they were before in terms of a place to to, to display art and people still coming there is there still going to be a studio I guess what I'm trying to get a sense of the use of the space and therefore who's going to be coming and going and potential impacts on for parking. Thank you. We'll turn to Ms. Verhagen. Good evening again, Ms. Verhagen. Okay. Good evening. Through the mayor to Councillor O'Keefe, the applicant indicated on the plans that those are outdoor landscaped areas, So, and they didn't indicate that it's a place of business, so we took it as that. It's an outdoor landscaped gar garden area. So that doesn't require any parking calculation. Okay. Thank you. And uh, a follow-up, if I may. So it's mentioned that um, the two parking stalls will be uh, accessible parking spaces. So where will able-bodied uh, people park when they visit uh, the, the business? Through the mayor again to Councillor O'Keefe, that's a good question. This is the, the way the bylaw was adopted by council to require these spaces to be adaptable. So those without a, a adaptable handicap accessible pass for their car um, would be parking elsewhere. The town doesn't monitor the use of marked parking spaces on private property. Um, it's up to the property owner or the strata to monitor that over the life of the development. We don't have the, the capacity or the authority to go onto private property to, to monitor sites over the life of the building. Um, but yet, yeah, if somebody was following the signals on the parking spaces, they would be parking elsewhere. So, it, so if those are specifically for, I mean, that's the intention, 
that they should be those are the bylaw requirements to provide those spaces so they are meeting the parking bylaw by signing those spaces for that use yeah but i i'm, I'm still struggling to figure out how do they meet the bylaw for regular parking spaces so they've they've got the accessible ones that's good but where do they meet the requirement for parking for the other spaces that would be required is is there not a requirement there so they're operating a there's a business operating there and a residence so i would think the residents would require a space the business would require i don't know at least a space so where are those being accommodated that's right the business requires one space based on the floor area and the residence also requires one space so they provided two spaces and the parking bylaw requires a certain number of spaces be accessible handicap accessible design which they've done so it doesn't require four spaces on site it just requires two so they're meeting the letter of the bylaw there and i i understand your concern that there's no regular par unsigned parking spaces in addition to these this is a very unique small property and if they designated any additional space for parking it reduces its value in terms of usable floor area landscape space all of the other uses that benefit the community so the bylaw doesn't require four parking spaces here it requires two and they're meeting the the bylaw there okay i guess i guess my concern is that we're setting sort of the bar that it's okay to use for able-bodied people to use accessible parking spots so i have i have a concern about that and maybe that's a, a policy thing that or something we need to st straighten out in the bylaw but um yeah that's a concern for me thank you i do have a, a question and then a comment um so the bylaw provision requires a, a one accessible space for the for the business and one accessible space for the residents no it doesn't it requires of the number of spaces provided that a certain number be the type a and the type b one of those i'm just out looking at the bylaw here to reference it oh, thank you. one of those is the the parking space with the adjacent access aisle and one is without given this the layout of the parking spaces here um they've got the access aisle uh, providing access to the parking spaces there um Sorry, I'm just looking in the bylaw here. Mr. Nincom, if you have anything to add in here, that would be helpful. No, I, I think that, that, that that's helpful. I do. Um, okay. Mr. Nincom? Uh, I just think the, uh, the earlier question that was posed was, are the residential parking spaces separate from the accessible parking spaces? And the answer to that is no. The accessible parking spaces are a... Um, a subset thank you a subset of the overall parking requirement on the property so if two parking spaces are required and the accessible parking space requirement is two then those two will be accessible spaces as as Ms. Verhagen said that the I guess the quirk here is that there are so few parking spaces required on this property that the bylaw doesn't function as it would with a typical you know 20 unit building um, and hence, this is exactly the type of situation that the development, per, development variance permit system was created to address because bylaws cannot address uh, every single situation out there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Newcomb. Uh, my comment is that um, one of the spaces is for the residents, uh, and so the residents living there can decide whether they wish to use that space uh, for accessible or for, for not accessible. They may not need an accessible space. We don't. Uh, we don't know. Uh, the other is that uh, it is office use uh, for the residents, for the business that the uh, that the owners of that business living in the residence have, and so again, it would be their um, uh, for their uh, their particular use. So it's not a gallery with uh, members of the public, uh, any members of the public uh, coming. It's it's uh, the particular residential use and the particular office use uh, for the residents that are living there. Uh, I turn back to Ms. Verhagen. Thank you. Yeah, I found this section of the parking bylaw. So section 4.7 for anybody who's interested to look it up in bylaw number 2140, the off-street parking and loading bylaw. 
Um, the bylaw says um, the required number of parking spaces shown in the table in terms of accessible spaces shall be as followed. So total required number of off-street parking spaces, your, the total number required is one to nine spaces. You need one type B and one type A. So they fall in there, they're required to have two spaces. So one is type A and one is type B. It doesn't say in addition to the other spaces. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reagan. Uh, Councillor Keith. Uh, yeah, thanks for the clarification. I, I guess um, I know we're going to be looking at parking requirements in the summer, so I, that's something that I'll be maybe wanting us to take a look at. I, my concern, I, I get the rationale, but I guess my concern is that the community gets the impression that it's okay for able-bodied people to park in a spot that's marked accessible, and that's, that's a common issue, even if it is on, on, on private land or private business, um, it's, it's an issue that I think we have to address. Uh, not tonight, obviously, but maybe when we look at the uh, bylaw again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, are there any further comments for discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Councillor Garnett and Councillor O'Keefe are opposed. The motion carries. Um, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Wainwright, uh, we do have correspondence, um, and uh, Councillor O'Keefe has referred to it. If we could have a motion to receive. Sorry? Oh, you did that first. I'm sorry. Thank you. Take it off. So we'll move to staff reports, and we do have the proposed Douglas fir tree removal at 2081 Weiler Avenue. I'll turn to Ms. Clary for an introduction, please. Good evening, Ms. Clary. Good evening. Um, so this uh, tree actually came before council in April 2020 um, in the early stages of the pandemic. At the time, um, the resident felt like um, maybe their application wasn't given a fair uh, review. So there was some additional correspondence with the resident included in the agenda package. Um, however, no additional um, arborist reports were, were included. Um, I'm here for any any, uh, if you have any questions, but um, staff is recommending denial of this application. Thank you, Ms. Clary. I'll move that the request be denied. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, Councillor O'Keefe. I, I agree with the motion, but I'll just make a comment so the uh, applicant has some idea why. I mean, when I look at this, um, they haven't provided any information aside from uh, some branches that have fallen uh, to justify why the tree should be taken down. The arborist report said the tree is of average health, so it sounds like it's okay with some minor defects. And although there is potential in the future for possible damage, um, but it didn't appear that there was any significant damage at that time. So if this applicant wants us to approve uh, taking down a tree, uh, need, we need a bit more information um, than what they've provided. So I will support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor O'Keefe. Seeing no further discussion, I'll call a question. All in favor? None opposed. The motion carries. And we'll turn to item 13B, which is the Ray Creek Bridge option. I'll turn to Mr. I'll turn to staff for an introduction, please. Oh, sorry. Can I myself? Sorry? Said, should I recuse I'm sorry, myself I do now? have a note here uh, that uh, uh, please go ahead. Uh, I'll recuse myself. I, I live in the Eaglehurst development. Thank you, Councillor. <coughs> And I will turn to staff for an introduction, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so uh, the intent of this report is to um, seek council approval for Sydney staff to begin discussions with North Saanich staff regarding a potential cost-sharing arrangement uh, that would allow for the um, construction of the Ray Creek Bridge crossing that would connect uh, Eaglehurst Developments in North Saanich with uh, Ray Creek and Peter Grant Parks in Sydney. So this item does have a fair bit of history associated with it. It goes back to the original development proposal uh, for Eaglehurst when a bridge crossing was being uh, contemplated uh, um, at the time by the developer and uh, as well as uh, North Saanich, uh, um, the, the district of North Saanich. 
Um, in January of 2022, 20, uh, North Saanich advanced the, the project uh, to consider, to start looking at uh, consideration of funding. Uh, there has um, been a fair bit of engagement on um, uh, three options uh, associated with, uh, with uh, um, the connection. Um, option one is that, uh, that uh, it's basically connecting uh, uh, a trail that would run adjacent to the Summergate residences. Um, the second option is a more direct connection across uh, Ray Creek. And the third is one that connects and runs adjacent uh, to, uh, to the highway. So the preferred option based upon feedback from residents of uh, both North Saanich and Sydney is the direct Ray Creek option, which is option two in the report. Uh, the estimated cost of this option is uh, approximately 260,000 and North Saanich uh, has already approved within their budget uh, uh, $200,000 for this particular project. Um, again, uh, it should be noted Sydney has not budgeted yet for this, uh, this project. It would be a new, if it's being considered, it would be a new item brought forward to the 2023 budget deliberations. So again, what's being requested is basically a, a negotiation at a staff level that would go back to our respective councils regarding what a cost sharing uh, arrangement might look like between the two municipalities to have this project proceed. Thank you, Mr. Rumble. I'll turn to council if there are any uh, questions. Uh, seeing none, we do have a recommendation. I'll move the recommendation that staff be authorized to start negotiations on a cost sharing arrangement with North Saanich staff for council's approval. Second. second. Uh, moved and seconded. Thank you, uh, Councillor Fallot. Thank you. I'm uh, pleased to see this come forward. Uh, it's been a long time coming and um, I, I love the option that uh, has been selected and I look forward to this project eventually happening. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fallon. Uh, further discussion? Uh, seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? Uh, none opposed, the motion carries. Thank you. We'll just invite Councillor Garnett back to the meeting. Mr. Hissick. Thank you, Councillor Garnett. That motion did, uh, the recommendation was approved unanimous. We'll move to uh, item 13C, which is the lease modification for the for proposed new waterfront public washrooms. And I'll turn to Mr. Humble for an introduction, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, yeah, in order to allow the um, new um, public washroom to be established at the um, um, selected waterfront site that is adjacent to uh, the walkway that uh, extends along the waterfront between uh, and the site is between the Victoria Distillery's um, uh, establishment as well as Rum Runner Pub. Um, it is being proposed that uh, essentially the town's head lease um, and we have a long-standing head lease uh, with Seaport Holdings Limited um, uh, that we amend that. That particular lease is a, is a, is a long-term lease that extends, I believe, another 32 years if all of the, uh, if all of the extensions are, are provided uh, up to 2054. Uh, the amendment would see the proposed washroom site uh, be removed from the head lease area so that it would be located now on uh, town-owned land that's basically unencumbered by that, uh, that head lease. And in doing so, the town would incorporate the two patio areas to the north into the actual head lease um, area. So in doing so, the town would relinquish the annual lease fees for these two patio areas, which equates to approximately uh, $3,200. Again, that's annually. Uh, it's noted that the two patio areas were previously never included in, uh, in the head lease lands and have always been based upon uh, separate five-year uh, renewal leases with uh, Seaport Holdings Limited and they subsequently subleased to the, uh, the two restaurant entities. Um, from a staff perspective, this represents a, a, a very good uh, arrangement for the, for the town. It allows the town to acquire the necessary lands for the washroom facility. At a, at a highly desirable location and at a, a nominal, nominal cost. Um, and there's a staff recommendation for council's consideration. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Humble. Uh, we'll turn to questions. I have one brief one, and I think it's uh, the question is answered in the in the diagram that um, that this the um, property that the uh, coming out of the head lease that the washrooms will be on will actually adjoin the existing town right of way uh, on the waterfront. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll turn to any questions or we have a recommendation. I'll move that the modification of lease number EC26622 between the town and Seaport Holdings Limited be approved, subject to the required statutory notice being published in the local paper. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, seeing none, I'll call the question. All in favor? None opposed. The motion carries unanimous. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Humble. Uh, and we will turn to um, item 13D, uh, status update on outstanding council action items. And back to you, Mr. Humble. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, it's noted in the report, this is the list of outstanding council resolutions or uh, action items coming from, um, that actually uh, come from a particular council meeting. So along with a, a status, and it also provides a status update on each one. And uh, it should be noted that this uh, list includes items up to the end of April 2022. Thank you. We'll turn to, uh, we do have a recommendation. Uh, or do you have a question, Councillor O'Keefe? Please go ahead. Um, so, question to staff on the uh, item on page three of the report for November 9th and the, the survey of businesses. Um, so, I'm kind of leaning towards making a motion to remove that from the um, list of action items because I think it's it's kind of old news now. We've, um, you know, if, if we had done it a year ago, maybe it would be okay. So I'm more inclined to say, let's take it off the list and save that $5,000 for use towards something else. Um, in the last little while, we, I think the chamber did their own survey of their members. SIP did a survey of businesses. We've also gone through a significant, um, uh, we, I think we did a survey and consultations through our consultant for the economic development survey. So I don't see that having another survey at this point is pointless. So that would be my leanings, but before I make that motion, a, a question to staff if you see any downside to that. I might uh, defer that uh, question or comment uh, to, uh, to Ms. Verhagen. Uh, from uh, my perspective, I don't see a downside <laughs> with, with that, quite frankly, but uh, okay. I'll defer to Ms. Verhagen. Hi, Ms. Verhagen. Hello. Uh, through the mayor to Councillor O'Keefe, um, I staff feel that it would be wise to, for us to contact the chamber and the SBA to see if they've commenced this work already and are expecting to receive part of the funds that were allocated for the work to be done. Um, we haven't been able to contact them yet about that, but we will be doing that soon. Thank you, Ms. Verhagen. If, okay. if I could consider, uh, uh, give consideration to a motion that um, that um, we uh, seek to remove um, uh, this item uh, subject to uh, consultation with uh, the SBA and the Chamber. Yep, that's what I was going to do, so I'll second that motion. Do you want to word it better than I did? Or? Um, I, think, I think staff have got the gist. Okay. Basically, you know, what I'm looking for is if they haven't started work on it, let's uh, just take it off the list. We have a mover. Second. And a seconder. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, the motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Uh, further items? Um, Councillor O'Keefe? Thank you. Uh, with no further questions, we do have a motion to receive. Move receive. Second. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Humble. We appreciate the update uh, on all of the outstanding resolutions. Uh, I'll call a question all in favor. Uh, the motion carries unanimous. Thank you. And we'll turn to our last item of business, the uh, monthly building report for May 2022. Move received for information. Second. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Motion carries unanimous. And with no further business, I would seek a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? 
We are adjourned. Thank you, Council. Thank you, staff. The timing was exquisite.